The People's Republic of China has big plans. By 2049, it aims to displace the United States as the world's most powerful country, completing its 180-degree turnaround from an impoverished colossus suffering under a supposed century of humiliation. It is a poetic goal, fit for an epic story. There's a fundamental flaw in the story, though, China's own geography, which effectively aids the United States' strategy to contain its ambitions. In this video, we'll explore the containment strategy and China's attempts to get around it. In the Cold War, the United States and its allies faced a big problem, literally. This was the European Plain, which begins at the Bay of Biscay in France and extends for thousands of miles all the way to the Ural Mountains. The further east you go, the broader the plain gets. With the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies extending from the Urals all the way to central Germany, the United States and NATOs were outnumbered and forced onto a narrow front. There, the Communist powers could concentrate all of their forces in an offensive drive to the west. For Washington, this geostrategic disadvantage meant that the only seemingly feasible means of containing communism in Europe was through nuclear deterrence. It was not the case in Asia. When the Chinese Communist Party took power in 1949, the United States came up with its island chain strategy to keep the People's Republic and its Soviet ally bottled up in the Eurasian landmass. The strategy, formalized in 1951, was largely the brainchild of John Foster Dulles, then an advisor to President Truman and later Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. Originally, the island chain strategy comprised three strings, essentially three lines of defense against communism in the Pacific. These lines remain in place today. The first island chain stretches from the Japanese archipelago down to Taiwan, through the Philippines, and finally into the Indonesian archipelago, stopping at the Strait of Malacca. The second island chain also starts from Japan, where it moves through its Bonin Islands, past the Japanese-governed Volcano Islands in Micronesia, past the Mariana Islands like Guam, through the Western Caroline Islands like Yap and Palau, and ends in Western New Guinea. Finally, in the classical strategy, there was the third island chain. This line starts at the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, and stretches through the vast center of the Pacific Ocean, through Hawaii, American Samoa, Fiji, and ends in New Zealand. In more recent times, as China's power has grown and as Beijing has displayed its ambitions for the Indian Ocean and Africa, some American national security experts have added fourth and fifth island chains to their planning. The fourth island chain moves southward from Pakistan through the Las Kadweep Islands and the Maldives westward of the Sri Lankan port of Hambantota which is controlled by China through its Belt and Road Initiative BRI, and the important US-UK military base of Diego Garcia. The fifth island chain, meanwhile, starts with the United States Camp Lemonnier base in Djibouti on the Gulf of Aden and hugs the African coastline. Although the fourth and fifth island chains have not been formally codified into American national security strategy, most experts have informally accepted them as being part of the United States' overall plan of containment. The first island chain was and remains the most important part of Washington's containment strategy. It's the shortest, easiest to defend, and encompasses a significant portion of the world's population and economic activity, making it clearly more important than the other island chains. For China to become anything more than a regional land power, it must first break the containment of the first island chain. Unfortunately for Beijing, this presents numerous challenges. China is a nation that heavily depends on food and energy imports, much of which goes through the South China Sea's shipping lanes, which are contained within the first island chain. China's economy also depends on its exports, which also go through these maritime trade routes. Any disruption to these trade routes in either form would prove devastating for the Chinese economy, which is already slowing down after decades of breakneck growth. To make matters worse for Beijing, the first island chain presents a series of natural choke points that the United States and its allies could use to cut that shipping off. These include the Straits of Malacca, Luzon, and Miyako. For China, being able to get around these choke points is an item of top priority. It has approached the problem from two directions. First, it's invested a large portion of the wealth of its economic rise into a hefty military buildup, especially its naval and air forces. China now has the world's largest navy by sheer number of vessels, although not by tonnage, and this marks a key disadvantage. Despite its numbers, China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, is still not capable of surviving a direct confrontation with the United States Navy. 
However, Beijing understands its military disadvantage and has adapted to the situation with a strategy of anti-access area denial, A2AD. This strategy is meant to make it too costly for the United States to project power into the first island chain, should conflict break out. In the event of a confrontation, China has an arsenal of thousands of ballistic and cruise missiles ready to destroy American ships and bases in the region. As part of this strategy, China has built and militarized artificial islands in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. Some of these, such as Mischief Reef, host ship-killing missiles and runways for fighter jets and bombers. If China cannot yet kick the United States out of the first island chain, it's raised the cost of projecting power into the area significantly and might reasonably hope to make sustained forward presence there politically untenable in the war-weary American homeland. This is the tyranny of distance. The United States is adapting to China's A2AD strategy, though, which makes it imperfect for Beijing's ambitions. In early 2021, the United States made plans to establish a string of precision strike missiles along the First Island chain as part of a $27.4 billion military package centering on the Indo-Pacific theater over the following six years. The precision strike missile is a land-based ballistic missile with a range between 60 and 500 kilometers, which can be launched from mobile rocket artillery platforms like HIMARS, making this weapon durable and harder for China to remove from the board with missile attacks. The precision strike missile is the coming replacement for ATACMS and has recently entered service in a limited capacity. The US Army announced it had received its first batch of these missiles on December 8, 2023. Stationing these weapons along the first island chain is, for Washington, a vital part of re-establishing a conventional deterrence that it acknowledges has eroded in recent years. Another of the most important adaptations for Washington to defend the first island chain is through the presence of new bases in the Philippines, which began in 2014 with the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement EDCA, and has expanded in 2023. Presumably, some of the precision strike missiles slated for delivery to the theater will be placed in these bases. China had once hoped to court the Philippines into its orbit, despite the dispute in the South China Sea under the friendly Rodrigo Duterte presidency. As part of this effort, China was supposed to invest $24 billion in BRI-related projects. Securing investment and strategic infrastructure in the Philippines would have been very valuable to Beijing, as it would have helped to break China's containment in the first island chain. However, the BRI investments never truly panned out, and Duterte's successor, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., withdrew from the project in late 2023. The end result? The United States has increased its presence in the Philippines, while China remains shut out. The crown jewel in China's ambition to break out of the first island chain is a conquest of Taiwan, which the People's Republic has always considered a rogue province left over from the Civil War and century of humiliation. As Taiwan sits at the center of the First Island chain, its importance was recognized as soon as the Chinese Communist Party came to power. As early as the 1950s, the United States committed to keeping the Communists out of Taiwan. When the mainland bombed the outlying Kinmen and Matsu Islands where Taiwanese troops were stationed and set off the first Taiwan Strait crisis, the United States Congress and the Eisenhower administration made it clear that they would use military force to destroy a Chinese invasion. Dulles even publicly threatened a nuclear attack on the Chinese mainland if the communists attempted to take the island. China had no choice but to back down, a dynamic that has repeated since then. China's more recent military buildup has increased the importance of Taiwan. For the first time, American national security officials are not entirely confident that the United States military can successfully defend the island, at least not without tremendous cost that the American public might be reluctant to bear. However, the United States continues to arm Taiwan through the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act. With this help, Taiwan has adopted what it calls a porcupine strategy, which aims to make the cost of an invasion as bloody as possible for Beijing. In a series of war games from January 2023, the Center for Strategic and International Studies found that out of 24 scenarios, China succeeded in an invasion twice, but it only did so when the United States did not intervene or when Japan did not allow it to use the bases in its territory. Even when China did succeed in conquering the island, it came at a cost of 70,000 casualties and 23,000 deaths. In a more realistic scenario, the costs would be far greater. Again, bad news for Beijing. The present situation suggests that for China, attempting to break out of the first island chain by military means is still too difficult or costly. 
However, many experts are still worried. If China were to break the containment of the first island chain, the line would become longer and much more difficult to defend, even if it's closer to the American homeland. For example, the United States Air Force would have a harder time projecting power as refueling operations would need to move north to keep tankers out of range of China's fighters. The United States Navy would lose command of the first island chain's choke points and would be more vulnerable to a Chinese missile threat that would extend hundreds of miles further east. For these reasons, the United States has invested more heavily in the second island chain in recent years to shore up the region's defenses. This comes in response to China's moves. For example, China has tried to expand its BRI into Micronesia. This is part of its strategy toward deeper political and economic integration in pursuit of its ultimate goal, which is to build bases in the second island chain that will allow it to project military power there. However, China's efforts in the area have met controversy. Two months before leaving office in May 2023, former Micronesian president David Penuelo claimed that China had tried to threaten, bribe, and otherwise pressure his country's officials to go along with its strategic goals. So far, though, China has had no luck in building a base in the second island chain. Unfortunately for Beijing, the United States also has deep ties to the region. It already has unlimited military access rights to Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. These rights are part of a pact between Washington and the Freely Associated States FAS, of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and Palau. This military access is expanding its infrastructure too, to make it more robust. In the summer of 2021, the United States and Micronesia agreed to build a new base there to allow a more permanent American military presence. So far, because of its territory in the area and the deep ties between Washington and the FAS, the United States has largely kept China at bay in the Second Island chain, and it's being assisted by Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and Taiwan in doing so. All of these countries understand that allowing China to build a presence in the Second Island chain would make them more vulnerable. China has had more success in the Third Island chain. The Third Island chain is important because it sits on the lines of travel and commerce between the United States and Australia. In World War II, the Japanese Empire attempted to disrupt this line. In the 21st century, China has increased its investments in the area, potentially hoping to do the same thing the Japanese tried to do. As part of this effort, China has increased its ties with the Solomon Islands and Kiribati. In the Solomons, China has taken advantage of increasing estrangement between that country and Australia. When the anti-Australia Manasse Sogovar returned to power as Prime Minister in 2019, Beijing seized on the opportunity. The Solomons withdrew its recognition of Taiwan that year and signed a memorandum of understanding that permits China to deploy its police forces to deal with internal unrest. The MOU also allows for some Chinese military presence. Although it does not permit the creation of a base, it allows for some rotational basing of Chinese military personnel. The expansion of China's security presence in the Solomon Islands is a direct threat to Australia, and it worries that country and its allies. Kiribati has also seen an increased Chinese presence. It too ended its recognition of Taiwan in favor of the mainland in 2019. In 2021, it signed on to a Chinese loan to lengthen an airstrip on the island of Canton. If this project is completed, China will have its easternmost facility. Although this will not be a full-blown air force base, it would give China an increased ability to conduct surveillance on the United States in the Third Island chain. Despite its success in the Third Island chain, however, Beijing has also encountered problems. The United States and Australia retain a big presence in the region. Tuvalu rejected China's attempts at influence. Meanwhile, China greatly desired to increase its presence in Papua New Guinea, which sits just north of Australia. China had hoped to incorporate Papua New Guinea into its infrastructure financing and renovate a port there that could be turned into an ideal base for the PLAN. Instead, Papua New Guinea offered the facility to the United States and Australia in a joint arrangement. This base sits just outside the reach of China's missiles. Overall, despite its recent successes there, the balance of power in the Third Island chain still favors the United States. The Fourth Island chain is a relatively new concept in American national security circles, but China's interest in the Indian Ocean has brought it to prominence. With China relatively contained within the first three island chains in the Western Pacific, it sought alternatives to access the world's waterways. While the waters off the Chinese mainland are surrounded by hostile islands, the Indian Ocean is a much more open place. China has partially succeeded in establishing footholds along the Fourth Island chain. 
Investments in Pakistan have been one of the cornerstones of China's BRI. These investments, called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC, center on the port of Gwadar, which gives China direct access to the Indian Ocean. China has increased this access further with its BRI investments in Sri Lanka, which has included a Chinese takeover of the Hambantota port with a lease of 99 years. China gained control of this port after the initial investment in the infrastructure proved unprofitable and the Sri Lankans were unable to pay the debt they had accrued. This BRI-related infrastructure is important and could signal Beijing's military intentions in the Fourth Island chain. For example, in August 2022, a Chinese ship arrived in Hambantota. Beijing called this a survey ship. However, the ship had also been used for military purposes, tracking satellites and missiles. Western and Indian national security experts were alarmed at its appearance. Chinese officials in the area gave it a warm welcome, while senior Sri Lankan officials were not present at the ceremony. The arrival of this ship was seen as a litmus test of how far China plans to militarize the BRI investments in these areas. However, China's strategy in the Fourth Island chain has faced some problems as well. BRI projects in Pakistan have faced financial difficulties and even terrorist attacks, which have forced them to scale back. The investment in Sri Lanka is more successful from a strategic, if not an economic perspective. There's a big obstacle in the Fourth Island chain even if the BRI-related projects pan out and China can find a way to militarize the area, the Diego Garcia naval base to the south. The Diego Garcia base allows the United States Navy and Air Force to rapidly project power into some of the most strategic areas in the world, like the Persian Gulf and the South China Sea. The advantage Diego Garcia gives the United States was punctuated in the summer of 2020, when three nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers arrived at the base. Diego Garcia is in fact only one of a select few bases equipped to handle the B-2, which requires careful climate-controlled hangars known as B-2 shelter systems. That such infrastructure will be built there signals how important this base is to Washington. Despite international controversy that China has understandably helped to fuel, it has no intentions of abandoning the base anytime soon. For China, having the infrastructure and the concentrated force required to overcome the United States military presence at Diego Garcia is a difficult challenge. Thus far, the United States maintains superiority in the fourth island chain and can disrupt China's strategy there. Finally, there is the fifth island chain. This one is unique as it features China's only actual overseas military base, the People's Liberation Army Support Base in Djibouti, which opened in 2017. The base is close to the United States Camp Lamonnier in the same country. Camp Lamonnier is closer to the coast than China's base is, however, which allows the United States greater leeway in projecting power into the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean. As of now, the fourth and especially fifth island chains are secondary theaters in the great power competition between the United States and China. However, they are an area of burgeoning importance. The moves China makes with its BRI investments in places like Sri Lanka will dictate how they evolve. Unsurprisingly, with all of these maritime disadvantages, China has had to find other ways to try and bypass its containment within the successive island chains. This is why the BRI has prioritized overland infrastructure investments and other beneficial arrangements across the Eurasian landmass spanning from China to Europe. For example, China has increasingly imported Russian energy through overland pipelines since the war in Ukraine began, protecting its energy supply from the US Navy's patrolling in the first island chain. However, with the difficulties that the BRI has faced, this has not proven to be a substitute for the true power projection that the successive island chains prevent China from achieving. Becoming a world superpower often requires favorable geography. The United States had such a geographical advantage from its inception, with weak neighbors and two vast oceans separating it from peer competitors, it avoided damage and disruption, and no one was in position to bottle up its trade or naval buildup. Geography has not been so kind to China. Surrounded as it is by hostile powers, China must come up with alternatives to project its power, but so far these have not proven satisfactory. Beijing may have plans to be the world superpower by 2049, but it would hardly be the first time that an authoritarian power could not deliver on its boasts. If China does not find a way around this problem, Xi Jinping's China dream will never come true. But what do you think? Will China be able to effectively break its containment within the island chains? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.
China's navy is catching up to the US, but while China's naval capability has come a long way from the third Taiwan crisis, its apparent strength is not all it seems. Here's why. Here are two of the most powerful countries in the world. Both China, the fourth largest country in terms of area spanning approximately 3.7 million square miles, and the United States, which is the third largest country by land area covering about 3.8 million square miles, are major economic powers with substantial global significance. China has the world's second largest economy with a GDP of approximately $18.1 trillion in 2022. The United States, however, has the largest economy globally, with a GDP of about $25.46 trillion in 2022. Okay, so the US has got China whipped when it comes to land area size and economic success, but what about military power? Well, here's where it gets scary. China aims to position itself as a significant global military power and has set its sights on achieving global dominance by 2049. Right now, China's Air Force ranks second globally, just behind the United States, which possesses the most formidable Air Force strength. According to reports, the United States operates approximately 10,000 more air platforms compared to China. In terms of total aircraft strength, China is listed as having 3,260 aircraft in service, while the United States boasts an impressive fleet of 13,233 aircraft. This substantial difference emphasizes the United States' superior air power and its larger operational aircraft count. But what about sea power? One of the markers of a superpower is the ability to project maritime power over long distances. States which have been able to do so have enormous influence in regional or world affairs and can exert huge leverage over their less capable rivals. It is therefore not surprising that as China's wealth has grown, it has invested heavily in its ambitions to create a blue water navy that it hopes will one day challenge the US Navy for supremacy, at least within the waters of its immediate neighborhood. But how close is China to that goal? What is the state of US-China strategic competition at sea, and how is the United States planning to maintain its lead on the world's waterways? What technologies and weapons is the US Navy developing to adapt to the growing power of China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN. You may have heard reports that China now has the world's largest navy, there are 355 ships in its fleet as of December 30th, 2021. The Chinese brass is keen to expand that number. It plans to increase its fleet size to 420 ships by 2025 and 460 ships by 2030. These figures do not cover the additional 85 patrol combatant ships and other small ships capable of bearing anti-ship cruise missiles. China's countless fishing boats have also acted as a de facto maritime militia harassing vessels from other countries in international waters. China's navy has the numbers, but here's the bad news. It is increasing in the quality of its ships as well. China was seen putting its new naval muscle to use in the summer of 2022, following a visit by then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. For several days after Pelosi left, Chinese ships and aircraft demonstrated their military potential in the waters off Taiwan. This show of force would have been inconceivable 25 years earlier, in the third Taiwan Strait crisis of 1995-96. At the time, when Taiwan was set to hold its first direct presidential election and became a fully-fledged democracy, the mainland launched several missiles across the Taiwan Strait, prompting the United States to send two carrier battle groups to the area. China had no choice but to back down in the face of such pressure, but the Chinese leadership never forgot the incident. To them, it recalled the century of humiliation a time in the 19th and early 20th centuries when China repeatedly found itself at the mercy of foreign powers. Since the Chinese leadership considers Taiwan a rogue province, continued American and allied military support for the island reminds them of those times. After the crisis, China resolved to never let such a scenario happen again and took steps to increase its naval power. This was a deviation from the norm. With only a few brief exceptions, China has never historically been a sea power. It has traditionally focused its military resources on maintaining a large army capable of defending its vast land borders. Up until recently, this was the objective of the Chinese brass. However, with China's continued problems with Taiwan and its containment within the natural barrier of the first island chain, a string of islands off China's waters which stretch from Japan to Indonesia, the Chinese leadership decided that only by becoming a sea power would China take its rightful place as a true global superpower. With its growing economic might, especially since it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, China finally had the chance to make a play for naval prominence. 
Included in China's new naval assets are three aircraft carriers. China's Naval Brass plans to increase that number and bring its carrier force up to five by 2030, with more to come after that. The PLAN also aims to increase its submarine force by building 10 ballistic missile submarines by the same year. While China's naval capability has come a long way from the third Taiwan crisis, its apparent strength is not all it seems. China may have more vessels in its fleets than any other country, but that is because most of the ships are still small. Aside from the number of ships, one way to measure a state's naval power is through the combined tonnage of its fleets. Tonnage is the measurement of a ship's weight. The PLAN's total combined tonnage as of 2020 is between 1.8 and 2 million tons. The US Navy, though, stands at 4.6 million tons. The reason why tonnage matters is because small, low-quality vessels do comparatively little in actual naval confrontation. The United States could build many more smaller boats if it wanted to, but instead focuses on sturdier vessels with advanced offensive and defensive weaponry and robust transit options for Marines to stage amphibious assaults. While many American policymakers have called for the United States to build more ships and restore the Navy to Cold War-level fleet sizes, no one in Washington is calling for an imitation of China's fleet composition. Small patrol boats and other irregular craft do the US Navy no good in its global mission to maintain secure and free navigation on the world's oceans. China has closed the tonnage gap since the time of the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, when the United States had a total tonnage lead of over 4 million, but it still lags significantly behind. China's Navy has other problems. Two of its much-publicized aircraft carriers are older models that use a STOBAR, short takeoff but arrested recovery system, to launch its planes. China's third aircraft carrier, the Fujian, uses a more modern catapult system comparable to those used by the US Navy's carriers, which allows it to launch its onboard planes faster. The Fujian is therefore a significant step in China's technological capability. However, how would China be able to launch its planes without pilots to fly them? China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators, and the Fujian and its successors will add to the stress, both in the number of pilots these new carriers will demand and in teaching them how to use the catapult system. Overall, the PLAN is many decades behind the US Navy's institutional knowledge and experience. Case in point, it lacks a fighter made specifically for training carrier pilots. The current aircraft of choice is the JL-9G, a single-engine, twin-seat plane that is incapable of simulating emergency landings on a carrier's flight deck because it is too light and slow. So far, the PLAN's attempts to create an adequate training aircraft have fallen short of satisfactory. Establishing programs for cadet naval aviators has also proven difficult for the PLAN. This lack of institutional knowledge and experience makes sense given China's history and its only recent move towards sea power. Unfortunately for the Chinese leadership, institutional knowledge doesn't come as easily as new ships do. China might have made progress at a rapid pace, but in a confrontation between carrier groups as they currently stand, the United States would still have an overwhelming advantage, for a few reasons. First, the United States has many more advanced fourth-generation and fifth-generation fighters to call upon. America's arsenal includes not only carrier-based planes, but land-based F-22s that would fly from Japan to lend a hand in a real battle. China's most advanced fighter, on the other hand, the J-20, cannot be launched from a carrier, and it's unclear if it can rival America's F-22 and F-35 in air-to-air -air combat. Meanwhile, upgraded Tomahawk cruise missiles and submarines would also pose significant threats to the burgeoning Chinese carrier force. Although we do not have good knowledge of the extent of China's electronic warfare capabilities, which could potentially counter such ship and submarine-fired missiles if they are advanced enough. Another area that the PLAN significantly lags behind the US Navy in is submarines, which was one of the reasons why Beijing made such a big protest about the AUKUS submarine sharing agreement. China currently has a fleet of 56 submarines. Six of them are ballistic missile submarines with payloads capable of reaching the United States' homeland. Another six are nuclear-powered attack submarines. The bulk of the fleet, 44, are diesel-electric attack submarines. This is where China's navy is at its most pronounced disadvantage and lags the furthest behind. Experts believe that China's current main submarine, the Shang class, is only on par with 1970s Soviet-era designs and China has not invested as much in anti-submarine warfare as in other parts of its naval buildup. It has tried to close the gap recently, equipping its newer surface ships with more sophisticated sonars, 
China has also introduced its new U-8 missile launch torpedo and KQ-200 maritime patrol aircraft. Even so, these are comparative baby steps in actually defeating the formidable American submarine force. China may also be able to deploy more submarines in its immediate waters, but it is still at a severe disadvantage in submarine-to-submarine -submarine warfare. A comparison of the engineering of the two navies' underwater vessels will paint a clearer picture of why the US Navy still has a decisive advantage in undersea warfare. The United States uses nuclear-powered submarines, which are faster, capable of diving deeper, and have a longer range than the submarines China uses. China's diesel-electric-based submarines have one advantage. When running on electric power, they are quieter than nuclear submarines. However, these vessels cannot run on electric power for long. They have to either surface or pop up a snorkel to recharge their electric batteries and run on diesel power for the duration of that operation. At that point, they are significantly noisier than nuclear subs and far more vulnerable to attack. Meanwhile, nuclear submarines can stay quiet and deep for months on end. Although the range and duration of operations would not necessarily be as important for the Chinese in a confrontation with the US Navy because hostile encounters would take place near Chinese waters, the depth, stealth ability, and operating times of the American and allied nuclear submarines would help to defeat China's strategy of overwhelming enemy naval forces with a rain of anti-access area-denial ballistic missiles. These projectiles currently pose a severe threat to American carrier groups and surface ships operating too close to China's waters. Submarines, on the other hand, are much harder to detect, and the US Navy's advantage in underwater operations allows the United States to threaten the Chinese mainland. As with aircraft carriers, China intends to build new next-generation submarines. By 2030, it could have between 30 and 40 nuclear-powered submarines. Whether it will have the institutional know-how to recruit and train competent submariners may be a more difficult matter to determine. China's current underwater deficiencies notwithstanding, it is still eager to flex its submarine muscle and has begun keeping at least one of its nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarines at sea at all times with near-continuous patrols into the hotly contested waters of the South China Sea, making things more difficult for the United States and its allies and the waters of the region more dangerous. It is a sign of what the PLAN seeks for the future. As things stand now, though, China tacitly acknowledges its disadvantages in maritime warfare and relies mostly on a defensive strategy to mitigate the threat that the US Navy poses. At the heart of its strategy are various classes of land-based short- and medium-range ballistic missiles. These missiles, based in mainland China and on its illegally built artificial islands in the South China Sea, pose a serious threat to American surface ships operating in the waters of the first island chain. Most formidable is its vast stockpile of short-range missiles, effective at distances up to 1,000 kilometers. The US Department of Defense estimates that China has between 750 and 1,500 of these, and they pose a menacing threat to Taiwan and every American base in Japan and South Korea too. China also has between 150 and 450 medium-range and 80 to 160 intermediate-range ballistic missiles respectively. These missiles can reach American ships and assets much further away from China's mainland. Some of them are capable of hitting Guam, the largest base in the region. China is currently building more ballistic missiles in an attempt to exert leverage over progressively more distant areas of the Indo-Pacific region. Additionally, although the PLAN is not currently capable of defeating the US Navy in a head-to-head -head confrontation, China would have the advantage of operating near its territory in any real conflict. No one on either side expects a midway-style battle on the high ocean. This reality means that the American supply lines would be much longer and more vulnerable to Chinese ballistic missile attacks, the tyranny of distance. China would also be able to concentrate all of its naval assets in a confrontation with the United States, where in contrast, the latter has global commitments. Policymakers and war planners in Washington have long sought to concentrate resources in the Indo-Pacific region to counter China's expansionism, but bureaucratic and international resistance have often thwarted those plans, with Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine putting even more pressure on the United States to maintain military forces in Europe at high levels. Between these commitments, China's sheer number of assets, the tricky supply situation, and China's continued buildup in quality and quantity, the US Navy cannot rely on maintaining its traditional superiority forever, and the stakes are getting higher. Many experts warn that slowly but surely, the United States is losing its traditional military advantage in the Indo-Pacific region. 
and the cost of victory in any potential confrontation with China has become much higher than even a decade ago. So what is the United States doing to keep its edge at sea in a time of growing competition? No American naval strategy in the Indo-Pacific region would come independent of the consideration of its allies, especially Japan. So what would be their contributions to the naval balance of power in the Indo-Pacific? Japan recently announced that it would spend 2% of its GDP on defense by 2027, lifting traditional post-World War II restrictions to build a military capable of offensive operations. A new aircraft carrier, the country's first since World War II, is included in those plans. Even so, decades of minimal defense spending and the loss of institutional know-how will not be overcome so easily. Some American policymakers and national security experts fear that the benefit of Japan's renewed commitment to its military will only show up well after 2027, when China's capabilities will be even higher than they are today. Other American allies in the region like Taiwan and the Philippines are not nearly as capable. South Korea has a strong army, but is not in a position to play a robust role in a sea confrontation with the growing strength of the PLAN. This reality means that the increasingly precarious situation will remain intact for the time being, with the overwhelming share of the Indo-Pacific's defense burden falling on the United States. One of the items on the US Navy's intermediate horizon is to arm its Zumwalt-class destroyers with hypersonic missiles by 2025. Tests of some ship-fired devices are currently scheduled for later that year. This weapon, called the Intermediate Range Conventional Prompt Strike, is a non-nuclear missile with a glide vehicle exceeding Mach 5 and a range of over 1,700 kilometers. The US Navy is also experimenting with ship-fire laser weapons that could act as a much better line of defense against China's big arsenal of ballistic missiles. The Navy received its first Helios, high-energy laser with integrated optical dazzler and surveillance system in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022 and has requested $35 million worth of them in its 2023 budget. The Helios system is ideal for countering anti-ship missiles and can do so cheaply, because lasers do not require stockpiles of ammunition, which can be expensive to manufacture and transport. Helios instead uses power from the ship itself and does not require a separate energy magazine, making each shot extremely cheap. The US Navy hopes that such cheap laser shots will one day efficiently nullify the much more expensive missiles they will be targeting. Helios is currently designed for integration on Burke and Arleigh-class ships, but the Navy is planning to adapt it elsewhere. Unlike with hypersonic missiles, the United States currently leads China in laser technology, but China is proceeding apace with its own plans. As drones and missiles get more sophisticated, laser countermeasures will only be more important in the future. The Navy had been experimenting with railguns, electromagnetic projectile weapons, for more than a decade, but suspended the program in 2021 in favor of hypersonic missiles. Suspension does not mean permanent consignment, however, and the Navy might pick the program back up. Like lasers, railguns have the advantage of not needing to carry as big of an ammunition magazine, since their projectiles are not launched with gunpowder or fuel, but electromagnetic power that can be generated from the host ship. Drones are also set to play a big part in the future of naval operations, including drone ships and submarines, such as the experimental Orca which will have a range of 6,500 nautical miles and be able to run alone for several months. The Navy plans for AUKUS to be capable of anti-submarine warfare, with MK-46 or MK-48 heavy torpedoes. They are even being designed to carry anti-ship missiles. Unmanned ships and submarines would at the very least be expendable targets for China to send its heavy stockpile of ballistic missiles at, reducing the high American casualties that they would otherwise cause and permit the United States to grow bolder as the Chinese deplete their stockpiles. As we have seen in the war in Ukraine, ammunition gets depleted quickly in a modern conflict. Ammunition which is often expensive to make, with its precision instruments and advanced electronics. Any cheap drone which can exhaust China's advanced munitions would be worth its weight in gold for the American naval brass. China is also keen on developing unmanned submersibles, signaling that this will be a burgeoning area of competition between the two rivals in the Indo-Pacific region. Drone carriers, unmanned ships, and unmanned submersibles are not the only aspects of science fiction that are quickly becoming a reality, however. Jetpacks are one of the more unusual ways that the US Navy is planning to maintain its maritime edge. Since their inceptions, the Navy and Marine Corps have been designed to work together. Supporting amphibious operations is one of the Navy's most important missions. One of the ways the Navy is planning to continue with this tradition is by experimenting with jetpacks. 
The jet suits the US Navy and its ally the Royal Navy is experimenting with can reach speeds of 85 miles per hour and altitudes of 12,000 feet. The US Navy was evidently inspired by the Iron Man movies. The Iron Man suits are powered by five gas turbine jet engines and weigh about 75 pounds when they have full tanks. Jet fuel, diesel, or even kerosene are all acceptable fuels. A test of a similar jet suit by the Royal Marines showed that these devices can be operated with a high degree of precision, enabling a wearer to take off from a speedboat and land on the deck of a much larger vessel. Although these prototype Iron Man suits are noisy, there will be less of a need for stealth in any real-world situation that they'd be used in. If naval combat gets to the point where one side is trying to board the enemy's ships, stealth is long gone. The Iron Man suits could also support amphibious operations, with US naval vessels launching marines at targeted areas. Imagine hundreds of them storming towards a shore. They would be much harder to target than helicopters or landing craft. Already, paramedics in Great Britain have used the jet suit to reach difficult places, and firefighters are also interested in the suit's ability to help them access hard areas rapidly. Though the world isn't quite ready for it yet, we probably aren't too far away from a world where swarms of marines decked out in Iron Man suits will take to the skies at low altitude. Because a naval confrontation between the US Navy and the PLAN would occur in the comparatively confined waters of the First Island chain and not on the high seas, the Iron Man suit could prove an effective method of projecting force. The US Navy remains the world's premier maritime fighting force, but as China's wealth and power continues to grow, and as the PLAN continues to modernize, the United States must continue to look for ways to push the envelope. With innovations that we might find hard to believe now, China wants to break out of the first island chain and have more of a voice in the waters of the world. The United States wants to contain China within the waters close to its territory. Whoever holds the edge in the technology race will come closest to achieving their respective goal. But what do you think? In a battle between the US and Chinese Navy, who would win? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. China has had its eyes set on Taiwan since the 17th century, and recently its grabby, power-hungry hands have been reaching towards this semiconductor-rich and technologically important little island more aggressively than usual. If only it wasn't for that pesky Taiwan Relations Act which requires the US to provide Taiwan with protection against anything that could jeopardize the security or the social or economic system of the people on Taiwan. Xi Jinping would probably already be all over Taiwan and its processing chips. Even so, China is not about to let go of the idea of fully taking over one of the world's most important economic focal points anytime soon. Exactly how worried should Taiwan be about China's potential invasion? When Russia invaded Ukraine in early 2022, it set off the largest conflict in Europe since World War II. Understandably, the surprise invasion sent shockwaves around the world, causing many countries to reevaluate their security. Nowhere was this more true than the island nation of Taiwan, another state with a large, threatening neighbor laying historical claim to its territory. Russia's invasion sparked fears of similar actions against Taiwan by China, a scenario which could destabilize not only East Asia, but potentially the entire world. How did Taiwan come to be such an important global economic center? One word, civil war. Here's what we mean. As with Russia and Ukraine, the shared history of Taiwan and China goes back hundreds of years. Throughout the 16th century, the Chinese gradually gained influence and control over the island then known as Formosa through intermarriage and trade. By the late 17th century, the Qing Dynasty officially incorporated Taiwan into its empire, by which point the island was mostly ethnically Han Chinese. In 1895, following its victory in the First Sino-Japanese War, Japan took control of Taiwan from China. The Japanese implemented economic and social reforms on the island, which led to limited modernization and industrialization. However, the occupation also resulted in widespread discrimination against Taiwanese people, who were viewed as inferior to the Japanese. With its loss at the end of World War II, Japan was forced to relinquish control of Taiwan, and the island was returned to Chinese rule. However, almost immediately, Taiwan became embroiled in the Chinese Civil War, which was raging at the time between the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists, led by Mao Zedong. In mainland China, the communists were victorious and in 1949 established the People's Republic of China, or PRC. The defeated nationalists were forced to flee to Taiwan, where they established the Republic of China, or ROC. 
With both governments still claiming to be the legitimate government of China, no peace agreement was ever signed, and the civil war technically continues to this day. Under the nationalist government, Taiwan experienced significant economic growth and modernization. However, it was also a period of severe authoritarian rule, with limited political freedom and human rights abuses. In the 1980s, there was a growing movement for democracy and Taiwanese identity, which led to protests and eventually a transition to democratic rule of the island in the 1990s. Today, Taiwan remains a prosperous democracy, with a vibrant civil society, legal protections, and a strong sense of Taiwanese identity. On the mainland, the PRC also went through some spectacular transformations. Most of Mao's rule was extremely turbulent, with industrialization, but also the mass famine of the Great Leap Forward and political chaos and repression of the Cultural Revolution. Following Mao's death, the PRC's new leader, Deng Xiaoping, began a series of economic reforms in 1978. Fueled by the market-based policies, massive investment in infrastructure, and cheap labor, these reforms would give China decades GDP growth exceeding 10% per year, lifting hundreds of millions from poverty and leaving the country as the world's second largest economy today. Yet throughout this period of transformation, the issue of Taiwan never went away, with both sides continuing to claim legitimate rulership of China. Under the PRC's One China principle, no country with whom it held diplomatic relations could recognize the ROC. For much of the Cold War, most governments continued to recognize the ROC, keeping the Chinese Communist Party relatively isolated. This changed by 1979, when the US switched its official recognition to the PRC, naming it as the sole legal government of China. But while it officially recognized Taiwan as part of China, the US also continued unofficial relations with Taiwan. Among other things, this has entailed providing the island with billions in advanced military assistance to defend itself from a potential invasion and regularly sending the navy through the Taiwan Strait. Today, Taiwan's status remains a highly contentious issue in China's relations with the US and others. China continues to view Taiwan as a renegade province that must be reunited with the mainland, while Taiwan sees itself as a separate and sovereign entity. Xi Jinping, the current leader of China, has reinforced this position, calling the reunification of Taiwan a historic mission and unshakable commitment for his government. Now, where have we heard that line before? Ah yes, Putin has been feeding it to the people of Russia as part of his war propaganda since February 2022. With the invasion of Ukraine and deteriorating relations between the US and China, many have begun to speculate about Taiwan. Will the island meet a similar fate? If so, would China fare better than Russia has? And if the US chooses to protect Taiwan, could such an invasion spiral into open conflict between superpowers? These questions are made more important by both Taiwan's role as the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer, a critical link in the modern global economy, and by America's purposefully ambiguous policy towards the issue. Their answers are also complex since any invasion of Taiwan would look very different from Ukraine and could be far more costly for both sides, reflecting the island's unique circumstances and singular importance to our modern world. In terms of sheer numbers, it is clear that China would have the advantage against Taiwan in almost every way. China has the world's largest population at 1.4 billion, compared to only 23.5 million in Taiwan. And China is an economic superpower, worth $18.3 trillion GDP to Taiwan's 1.27 trillion. Similarly, China's armed forces, the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, has over 2 million active forces to Taiwan's 169,000, as well as vastly more tanks, aircrafts, submarines, naval ships, and artillery. Its enormous military budget of $225 billion also dwarfs Taiwan's, leaving little doubt which is the stronger power in absolute terms. Yet, as the war in Ukraine has shown, numbers alone don't count for everything, and despite the odds against it, Taiwan's military and economy is still in a far better position than Ukraine's was prior to the Russian invasion. In 2021, the Taiwanese defense budget was over $15 billion, nearly three times that of Ukraine for the same year, while its overall GDP was nearly five times larger. But that's not all. Taiwan also has a modern military with advanced technology and well-trained soldiers. The US has been supplying the island with powerful weapons for decades, including F-16 fighter jets, upgraded Patriot missile batteries, Abrams tanks, and other advanced systems that Ukraine doesn't have or is only beginning to receive. 
While these would not close the military gap with China, it would put Taiwan in a better position than Ukraine was at the start of its invasion. Then, there is the problem of the potential invasion itself. Unlike Ukraine and Russia, Taiwan does not share a land border with China, but is separated by the Taiwan Strait, a body of water still over 80 miles at its narrowest point. That means any invasion would have to be an amphibious assault. The lowest estimates of the Chinese forces necessary for a successful campaign are over 300,000. And to achieve the 3 to 1 superiority in numbers that most commanders look for in offensive operations, the PLA would need an invasion force of 1.3 to 2.5 million. In comparison, D-Day, the largest amphibious invasion in history up to this point, had only 156,000 total troops. Additionally, despite having better capabilities than Russia, the PLA has not seen combat since 1979, and few of its officers have real battle experience. Military experts still generally agree that China could take Taipei through massive force and numbers, but how easily and whether it could hold the territory for long are less clear. Additionally, the geography of Taiwan would work to its advantage in an invasion scenario. The country is actually made up of over 100 islands, many of them too small to see on a map. Most of the outer islands are packed with missiles, rocket systems and artillery, while an extensive bunker system has been tunneled into the outer granite hills. The main island is rugged, with dense forests, and 258 mountains over 10,000 feet in elevation. And as China analyst Ian Easton has noted, unlike Normandy, the coastal terrain here is a defender's dream come true. Taiwan has only 14 small invasion beaches, and they are bordered by cliffs and urban jungles. Structures made of steel-reinforced concrete blanket the surrounding valleys. Taiwan gets hit by typhoons and earthquakes all the time, so each building and bridge is designed to withstand severe buffeting. This defensibility would also make it easier for an insurgency to form if China did take control of the island. Taiwan has a large and well-trained reserve force that could engage in guerrilla warfare and hide in tunnels and forests. And while gun ownership on the island is strictly regulated, civilian arms training has increased in recent years. The owner of one shooting range in Taipei told Reuters that attendees had tripled or quadrupled since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. As one tattoo artist and reservist put it, most people don't want to go to war. I also don't want to go to war, but in the unfortunate event of this really happening, I will be mentally prepared. The terrain in Taiwan, with its mountains and forests, would also make it difficult for the PLA to locate and neutralize any resistance. This would make an occupation of the island difficult and costly, potentially leading to a protracted conflict which could wear down Chinese morale. But the obstacles don't end there. Another difficulty China would face in an invasion is international support for Taiwan. While Taiwan only has official relations with 13 other countries due to the PRC's international pressure, it maintains strong unofficial relations with the US, Japan, and other powerful states. The question of whether the US would aid Taiwan against an invasion has long been a critical question. Since it began relations with the PRC, the United States has maintained a position of strategic ambiguity, purposefully not making clear whether it would respond to an attack on Taiwan. However, with the recent heightened tensions, this policy has come into question. When asked in late 2022 whether he would send US forces to defend the island, President Joe Biden replied yes, if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. Although a White House spokesperson later claimed the US policy had not changed, Biden's comments made it clear how vital Taiwan remains to US economic and military interests. If China launched a full-scale invasion, there is little doubt that the US would respond in some fashion, possibly through increased military aid to rebels, harsh economic sanctions on Chinese markets, or even the active deployment of advisors and troops to assist Taiwanese forces. US involvement would present a serious obstacle to China occupying or annexing the island for any length of time, especially since the PLA's capabilities and resources are still far less substantial than the US military. And with Taiwan in chaos, both China and the US would have difficulty supplying their military-industrial complexes. This points to another major difficulty China would face in invading Taiwan, the profound disruption it would cause to the world economy. While the invasion of Ukraine created chaos in energy markets and supply chains around the world, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would cause far greater damage, pointing to just how important the island is to the modern world. This is primarily due to semiconductors, which are necessary for nearly all modern electronics, from smartphones to GPS to fighter jets and missile systems. 
As the electronic industry in the US picked up in the 1960s and 70s, semiconductors became increasingly sophisticated, allowing for massive advances in computing power. But beginning in the 1980s, companies began to outsource the highly technical and expensive process of fabricating semiconductors to East Asian countries with cheaper labor. Over the next several decades, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, would become the most successful example of this, making itself into the largest and most advanced semiconductor manufacturer in the world. Taiwan's market dominance is such that today, more than 90% of global semiconductor manufacturing takes place on the island, making TSMC the 10th largest corporation in the world. And while the US is now taking strides to increase its domestic semiconductor manufacturing, Taiwan remains the linchpin to the industry, and thus to the modern digital economy. Here's the bad news. A Chinese invasion would catastrophically disrupt global supply chains and could lead to significant economic consequences, including shortages and recession. An active conflict on Taiwan would almost certainly slow down or halt fabrication of semiconductors and potentially damage or destroy the fabrication facilities. Furthermore, any military conflict would lead to a sharp decline in consumer confidence and businesses would hesitate to invest in the region. This would ultimately harm China's economic output for years to come, as it is heavily dependent on exports, as well as on the uninterrupted production of semiconductors, which make up more than 50% of Taiwan's exports to the PRC. But while the economic consequences would certainly damage the Chinese economy, that is no guarantee an invasion will not happen. Taiwan's geopolitical value is great enough that Beijing may risk the consequences just to control Taiwan's fabrication facilities, which would give both China complete control over the industry and completely seal off America's supply of the most advanced semiconductors. This could theoretically allow China to gain the upper hand in everything from commercial electronics to artificial intelligence and weapons production. For all these reasons and more, it is clear that any conflict between China and Taiwan would be complex and have far-reaching consequences. Whoever controls the supply chain for semiconductors will most likely become the dominant power of the 21st century. While such a conflict still seems unlikely today, geopolitical pressures could certainly create the conditions for a Chinese invasion. However, even if that takes place, there is reason to believe that such an invasion would face tremendous difficulties and require nearly all of China's military capabilities. But what do you think? How likely is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? And how would China fare in such a scenario? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more content from military experts. China has taken a bold step to protect its interests and gain more influence. It has built massive artificial islands, equipped with military installations and defense capabilities. But as the world looked on, China didn't see the big problem coming that would mess up its plan for more power. Here's what happened. China aims to be the world's leading superpower by the year 2049, the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party's victory over the nationalists in the civil war and rise to power on the mainland. Unfortunately for Beijing, China's own geography works against it in achieving this goal. China is surrounded by hostile islands that prevent it from projecting power into the world's oceans and threaten to cut off the shipping its economy relies on. To help mitigate this geographical disadvantage, China has attempted to increase its power in the strategically vital South China Sea, seizing control of disputed islands, rocks and reefs. China has since fortified these areas by creating artificial islands and militarizing them with airfields and hangars, radar stations, anti-aircraft weapons, and ship-killing hardware. The United States and China's neighbors in the region watched this island-building campaign with great alarm, marveling at how quickly China built and militarized its islands. However, these artificial islands aren't all they're cracked up to be. In trying to solve one problem, China only created another. Let's just say that these islands might not have the staying power that China needs them to have if it wants to use them as an effective method of power projection in the first island chain. Let's explore the reasons why China built the islands to begin with, why these islands are now in trouble, and why Beijing's ambitions in the South China Sea might sink, literally. The legal origin of the artificial islands comes from China's infamous Nine Dash Line map which it has used to claim 90% of the waters in the South China Sea. Officially, China justifies this claim and the Nine Dash Line with historical anecdotes. For example, China maintains that it and its people 
had been in the South China Sea since the days of the mythical Xia dynasty that supposedly began in about the year 2070 BC. Naturally, few people believe these assertions. The historical claims were fig leaves to hide a more cynical, self-interested motive. The South China Sea's waters are economically and geostrategically vital. Economically, the South China Sea has about 15% of the world's total fishing potential, 11 billion barrels of oil, and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. In 2021, 22% of the world's global trade, valued at about $5.3 trillion, passed through the shipping lanes in this area, including 60% of all maritime trade, 40% of the world's petroleum products, and one-third of the world's total shipping. Simply put, whoever controls these waters controls the fates of the countries that rely on this trade. China is one such country. By building its artificial islands and fortifying the area, China can more easily protect its own trade, muscle in on the natural resources in the South China Sea, and exclude the access of other nations, or at least charge them expensive tolls for the use of such resources. Geostrategically, however, the South China Sea is still trapped within the first island chain. To make matters worse for Beijing, these island nations are aligned with China's strategic rival, the United States. Because of the geopolitical alignment, the United States Navy can easily blockade a series of choke points around the South China Sea and disrupt or cut off shipping to the Chinese mainland. The most important of these choke points is the Strait of Malacca, through which China gets a large portion of its energy. In 2016, 16 million barrels of oil and 3.2 million barrels of liquefied natural gas pass through these narrow waters every day, a figure that is likely now higher. China's dependency on the trade that passes through this choke point has been called its Malacca Dilemma, and Beijing has often used this supposed vulnerability as an excuse for its territorial expansion in the area. By building and militarizing islands, China can theoretically bring more ships, aircraft, and missiles closer to the Strait of Malacca and other hotspots giving it more leverage over the choke points and making it more costly for the United States Navy to project power into the First Island chain. To make a long story short, China wants to seize control of the rocks and reefs in the South China Sea to promote its own self-interest at the expense of other nations like the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam, on whose exclusive economic zones Beijing has encroached. A 2016 ruling against Beijing by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague which completely invalidated the Nine Dash Line as a legitimate territorial claim, was simply ignored. As is often the case in international relations, the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. China had expanded its reach into the South China Sea through military means since the 1970s, when it seized control of the Paracel Islands from Vietnam. However, China began its modern campaign in the South China Sea when it seized control of the Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines in 2012. The following year, China started to expand much further. It began building artificial islands in the Spratlys, creating 3,200 new acres of land, militarizing the islands as the years went by. In total, China has 28 outposts in the waters of its supposed Nine Dash line map. 20 of these outposts are in the Paracel Islands, an additional 7 are in the Spratlys, and it also has the Scarborough Shoal. The artificial island building campaign centered mostly on the Spratlys. Artificial islands are created by dredging and shifting material from the reefs and seafloor beneath them. Rocks and sand must be pulverized in this process and, naturally, the creation of artificial islands was destructive to the wildlife in the area. Mounds of material needed to be pulverized and moved in the process. The American Admiral Harry Harris, who was commander of the United States Pacific Fleet at the time these constructions were taking place, called these artificial islands China's Great Wall of Sand in a speech delivered to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in March 2015. According to an analysis by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, China has reclaimed a total of 13.5 square kilometers of land across the seven reefs it has used in its island-building campaign. China's island-building vessels can dredge up material at impressive rates. Just one of them, the Tianjin Hao, operated by CCCC Tianjin Dredging, can deploy a cutter with the power of 4,200 kilowatts to the seabed. Material is then moved through a pipeline ashore for land reclamation purposes or onto a barge. The Tianjin Hao can deploy its cutter to a depth of 30 meters and extract 4,500 cubic meters of material per hour. 
between February and March 2014, this ship was spotted conducting dredging operations in Johnson Reef in the Spratly Islands. This area has now been occupied by China, and the reef has since been militarized. Although Johnson Reef is too small to host aircraft, it is armed with anti-aircraft guns and radar systems, contributing to a potential Chinese defense in depth of the area should hostilities break out in the region. CSIS considers Johnson Reef to have been a test run for more sophisticated military structures at more famous and well-armed places like Fiery Cross Reef, Mischief Reef, and Subi Reef. The Tianjin Hao was far from the only such ship in China's dredging operations, which can only be described as having been a success. To counter China's Great Wall of Sand island-building campaign, the United States Navy has conducted Freedom of Navigation Operations FONOPS, since 2015. These operations see the close transit of US Navy ships and aircraft around the artificial islands in an attempt to ensure that the South China Sea's shipping lanes stay open. These FONOPs have done little to alter the situation in the South China Sea, however, and numerous close calls between the American and Chinese militaries in the area have led some in Washington to call for them to end. On the flip side, other national security strategists believe that ending the FONOPs and essentially ceding the military prerogative in the area to China would only allow Beijing to entrench itself in the region that much further. Without the United States Navy maintaining a presence in the area, they fear that China's People's Liberation Army Navy would be completely unfettered in asserting its will over the shipping lanes and other countries in the area. Fortunately for the United States and China's weaker regional neighbors, the US Navy might no longer need to do the heavy work alone. Nature itself is assisting in the effort to prevent Chinese hegemony in the South China Sea because the artificial islands are starting to erode and sink. As early as 2019, it became apparent that China's islands were not as stable as Beijing was hoping for. In the first place, China has extended its reputation for often shoddy construction methods to the new islands. The Economist reported that the concrete China used in building the island bases could not cope with the elemental settings in the area. This concrete was instead turning to sponge in such conditions. Additionally, there is vast corruption within China's construction industry. This corruption has extended to China's military ambitions before. For example, in 2019, Su Bo, the overseer of construction for China's Liaoning aircraft carrier, was convicted on corruption charges and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Corruption in the construction industry has often led to substandard work, and the same appears to be the case on many of the artificial islands in the South China Sea. As is often the case, China appears to have cut corners in its construction methods. The concrete which displayed problems was not laid properly on all of the islands. For best results, metal rods should have first been driven into the seabed and then a concrete retaining wall built around the island. This was not always the case, and the structural integrity of some of the islands has begun to erode because of this lack of precaution. For China, speed and cheapness was the priority in these island-building campaigns which explains why they were built so rapidly. Perhaps international observers should have been a little less alarmed. Much like China's belt and road infrastructure projects and domestic building efforts, quality control was not at the top of the list of priorities in the islands. It also does not help that China has little experience with building structures that would be designed to survive in the type of elements seen in the South China Sea. Beijing made the matter worse and exacerbated its disadvantage by refusing to call in foreign experts for assistance during the island-building campaign. The result is that the islands and the infrastructure that make up the bases on top of them were not constructed with top-of-the-line materials. In fact, the islands at Subi Reef, Mischief Reef, and Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratlys were so unstable that fighter jets from the People's Liberation Army Air Force PLAAF, had not landed on the airfields there by 2020. This is unlike Woody Island in the Paracels which China has militarized with a runway capable of supporting the landing of heavy bombers, a feat it had demonstrated in 2018. The lack of use of the runways in the Spratly bases begs the question of why China would choose to build such long structures if they were not going to be used for aircraft. Experts concede that the decision not to land military aircraft there may be seen as a gesture of goodwill to reduce tensions in the region. However, given China's brazen and belligerent stance, this is unlikely. By far the likelier explanation is that the islands are in some way an illusion and cannot support such operations. The weather and climate will also be problems for China going forward. A hit from a powerful typhoon, 
could prove far more devastating to the Chinese constructions than their shoddy concrete. As ocean water warms with a warming global climate, these super typhoons will probably occur in the South China Sea more frequently. China appears to have made no plans for this contingency, however. One super typhoon in the South China Sea hitting in the wrong place might undo all the years of effort Beijing put into its island-building campaign. A warming climate causes other difficulties for China's artificial islands. These islands were not built with any sea walls or other protective infrastructure to preserve them against rising waters. However, as the climate warms, glaciers in the Arctic and Antarctic melt and add to rising seas. Since 1992, global sea levels have risen by almost 4 inches and continue to rise at a rate of about 0.15 inches per year. NASA predicts that by 2050, sea levels along the American coastline could be 10 to 12 inches higher than they are today, and the more global temperatures warm, the faster the glaciers will melt and the more rapidly the ocean will rise. For example, the ocean rose twice as fast between 2013 and 2022 than it had between 1993 and 2002. Although it's uncertain how far sea levels will rise by the end of the century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that in the best-case scenario, sea levels will rise between 11 and 21.5 inches from now to then. In worst-case scenarios, where competition between states and resurgent nationalism takes priority over environmental concerns, sea levels could rise as high as 40 inches. These sea level rises do not necessarily mean that all coastal communities as they currently exist will need to evacuate. Many communities have seawalls and other defenses. However, China's artificial islands are built at sea level and have no such defenses against erosion and rising waters. China meant the islands to be a string of permanent fortifications in the South China Sea, but it did not build them in a way that would be fit for this purpose. The problem of sea level rise gets worse when one considers that China destroyed vast swathes of coral reef and mangroves in the construction efforts. These structures form a natural barrier against the elements. This is because they break waves and dissipate their energy. Coral reefs allow for sediment to establish itself on the shallow and flat portions of the reef, where mangroves can establish themselves. Once there, the mangroves further break apart the energy of waves and storm surges since the roots and trunks of the trees absorb some of the water. When taken together, these coral reefs and mangroves provide a first line of defense against things like sea level rise and storm surges from typhoons. However, China destroyed these same ecosystems when it began constructing its artificial islands. In an ironic twist that some observers might call a case of poetic justice, China wiped out the very defenses that their islands would have needed to have more staying power in the wake of a warming climate, rising sea levels, and more frequent and powerful typhoons. In 2019, China claimed that it would begin work to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. China's Ministry of Natural Resources said that facilities to protect and recover these reefs had been installed on Fiery Cross, Subi, and Mischief Reefs. It also said it would survey more areas to identify where coral reefs had been damaged or destroyed and adopt a combination of natural and artificial methods to help the reefs recover themselves. However, China does not exactly have a good track record in this area because in 2015, its State Oceanic Administration claimed that construction of the artificial islands did not alter the health of the Spratly Islands ecosystem. These statements came at the same time that ships like the Tianying Hao were dredging and pulverizing the coral reefs. China also claimed that overfishing and natural causes had damaged the reef long before construction began. With such history, it's little wonder why few trusted China's word in 2019. And about five years later, there is still little evidence that China has meaningfully worked to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. Perhaps as sea levels rise and the risk of severe typhoons increase, Beijing will have no choice but to try to make good on its word out of calculations of self-interest. It has invested significant national prestige into its artificial island building campaign and created much bitterness around the world as the price for it. If these islands were to fail in their purpose, Beijing will have wasted a large amount of resources for little gain. However, there is another danger that comes with investing so much to try to shore the artificial islands up. Such investment in some ways defeats the very reason to build fortifications in the first place. The purpose of fortification is not to be an impregnable defense, but to make it more costly for an enemy to project power and to free resources for the builder of the fortification to project power in other theaters. By leaving comparatively few soldiers or weapon systems in a fortification, these assets of military power can be deployed elsewhere where they can be put to better use. 
However, at the rate the islands are deteriorating and threatened by weather and climate, China might need to continually concentrate resources on saving this Great Wall of Sand, rather than using it as an effective method of statecraft. The fortifications that were supposed to be an aid to Chinese power projection might increasingly become a drain on it as they become more expensive to maintain in terms of money and labor hours spent on them. In some ways, the problems facing the artificial islands in the South China Sea were predictable, as they follow a historical pattern concerning China. China is and always has been a colossus of a nation. However, it also has a history of not being able to live up to its full potential. For example, it was the wealthiest country in the world even into the 19th century. But despite this, it was unable to effectively use this advantage to compete with the Western powers and Japan. Now, history might be repeating itself. China is again a wealthy and powerful nation, but it is increasingly plagued with problems that might not permit it to achieve the full potential of its recovered status on the world stage. The expansion in the South China Sea has mirrored this age-old conundrum for Beijing. At first, it appeared the island-building campaign would solidify its place on the road to hegemony in the area. But through alienation of its neighbors, poor planning and shoddy construction, these edifices might be the latest example of history repeating itself, with China not being able to take advantage of its latent potential. The islands were supposed to be a signal to the world that China was back, rejuvenated, as Xi Jinping might say. But if they sink, it will be a signal of another sort. There is no doubt that the artificial islands succeeded in accomplishing China's short-term goals for the South China Sea. However, the game of nations is always a marathon and not a sprint. If the islands cannot stay for the long haul, they will cost China far more than they have gained for it. But what do you think about China's artificial islands in the South China Sea? Do you think they will have the staying power and can be an effective method of power projection for China in the future? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. And also, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Will Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping become the world's next power couple? At this point, it's hard to tell. But one thing's for sure, they have been and still are spending a lot of time together and it's terrifying. In October 2023, Vladimir Putin made a now rare trip beyond Russia's borders. After the invasion of Ukraine, Russia's dictator has been largely isolated from the world stage. This is especially so since his indictment by the International Criminal Court for war crimes of unlawful deportation and transfer of children from the occupied areas of Ukraine. Following this indictment, any country that is a member of the ICC has the duty to arrest him should he step foot on their soil. There is one country that's safe for him to go though, the People's Republic of China. It was there that Putin went to participate in China's Belt and Road Forum, where he would be the leading guest. In his second face-to-face -face meeting with the Chinese dictator Xi Jinping this year, Putin praised his dear friend. Meanwhile, in his own speech, Xi declared his opposition to geopolitical rivalry, economic sanctions, coercion, and decoupling supply chains. Meanwhile, Putin said, Russia and China, like most countries of the world, share the desire for equal, mutually beneficial cooperation in order to achieve universal, sustainable, and long-term economic progress and social well-being, while respecting the diversity of civilization and the right of each state to its own developmental model. These are not mere buzzwords on the part of the two leaders, but statements of their vision for a new world order. But what is the new world order? Let's explore the relationship between China and Russia, Xi and Putin, what their goals are, what it means for the world, and whether this strategic partnership can pose a true challenge to America's global leadership. Since taking power in 1999, Vladimir Putin has made 16 visits to China. Meanwhile, after Xi Jinping became China's dictator in 2012, he has made nine visits to Russia, more than any other country. The two men have met over 40 times during the last decade. Putin and Xi are like-minded leaders. Both men have presided over periods of authoritarian backsliding within their respective nations. They also share similar worldviews and foreign policy goals. Even when the cameras aren't on, it's reported that the two dictators have a good personal relationship. The two men have often called one another friends, and while this might be standard fare diplomatic language, Xi is not usually as complimentary of foreign leaders as he is with Putin, who he referred to as his best friend at a meeting in 2019. Body language experts have noted the warmth displayed between the two during their many meetings. 
For China and Russia, this is a new and relatively revolutionary development in their bilateral relations. For most of their recognized history, these two countries have been rivals. Their first formal agreement came with the Treaty of Nechinsk in 1689 between the Tsars and the Qing dynasty. The treaty resolved the issue of the Russian encroachment into Chinese territory in Outer Manchuria. The treaty was seen to be in the Qing's favor as it limited Russian expansion to the east and south, preventing it from going south of the Amur River and reaching what is today Vladivostok. However, Russia never wholly gave up its ambitions in this area. It seized the opportunity provided by China's 19th century period of weakness and annexed the Outer Manchurian territories, which make up its present-day borders. The 1860 Treaty of Peking formalized this annexation. Tensions over Port Arthur, now the Lushanku district, followed. Again, a weak China was forced to cooperate with Russia's aims on its historical territory. Relations in the 20th century were even tenser. In 1929, the Soviet Union fought the then Republic of China for control of the Chinese Eastern Railway in Manchuria. Succeeding in the effort, relations improved when the Chinese Communist Party seized power in 1949 resulting in a formal military alliance between the two largest communist countries. However, they quickly deteriorated again after Joseph Stalin's death. The alliance ended in 1961. In 1969, a seven-month border war broke out in the Far Eastern areas that had been under dispute for three centuries. The border issue was not fully settled until the 2000s. Aside from these border tensions, the two countries often sniped at one another over ideological disagreements. For example, China accused the Soviet Union of having a phony commitment to communism. Things are radically different today. The Soviet Union's collapse led to the era of American hegemony on the world stage, a reality that neither country was fond of but had no power to do anything about individually. To make a change to the international order, both would need to swallow their pride. In 1997, Yang Zemin and Boris Yeltsin, then the leaders of China and Russia respectively, signed an agreement. This was not a formal alliance, but it laid the foundation of the two countries' strategic partnership today. The declaration endorsed a vision for a multipolar world. Yeltsin said, Someone wants to dictate order in the world, and we want a multipolar world. These poles constitute the foundation of a new world order. At a time when America's global hegemony was at its peak, the words seemed to ring hollow, but it was a statement of intent for things to come. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin have both echoed the language laid out in the 1997 declaration. Both leaders oppose what they view as two prevailing features of the American-led global order, unipolarity and universality. Unipolarity is the idea of American hegemonic status within the international system, where it has the power to do what it wants on the world stage with little opposition. Both Moscow and Beijing believe the current international order gives Washington far too much power and they mean to change that arrangement. Their aim is to create a world where they have a far greater say in international affairs and where the balance of international power would not be as lopsided in favor of the United States. This is what Xi meant when he spoke of his opposition to unilateral sanctions in his speech at the October 23 Belt and Road Forum. Because the United States commands so much economic power with the dollar as the world's reserve currency, the sanctions on Russia following its invasion of Ukraine have proven devastating and isolating for Moscow. China would not want to face the same consequences for invading Taiwan. In this, the dragon and the bear have similar interests. A multipolar world would not have one superpower, but a series of great powers balancing against each other. This arrangement has been the historical norm. China and Russia seek to restore it at the expense of the United States. The Chinese and Russian opposition to unipolarity comes from traditional balance of power calculations in international relations. For example, Putin views NATO's eastward expansion as an expression of unipolarity that threatens a secure balance of power for Russia in Europe. This is partly why he went to war in Georgia and Ukraine to prevent them from becoming members. Their sovereignty and right to self-determination were not things on his mind. As we will see in a moment, he considers these concepts an extension of Western philosophical norms that he does not recognize as valid. Xi and Putin's opposition to what they call universality is more ideological and arguably gives the strategic partnership a more solid basis than if it were based purely in terms of self-interest. Both leaders resent what they view as the United States attempting to impose its ideas about democracy, human rights, and other Western liberal values on the rest of the world. For Xi and Putin, this insistence is an abridgment of their nation's historical experience and their prerogative to govern themselves according to their cultural norms. 
Both dictators fear that the United States would, if possible, overthrow their respective regimes. They saw the Euromaidan movement in Ukraine and successive periods of unrest in Hong Kong as dress rehearsals for revolutions at home that would topple them from their thrones. Rather than liberal universalism, Xi and Putin view the world in terms of separate civilization states and spheres of influence. To them and to other figures who believe in the idea too, like Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, separate civilizations are characterized more by their cultural ties than national borders or citizenships. Each civilization has its distinct cultural tradition, which the formal mechanisms of state power have the responsibility of protecting. When Putin mentioned that his country and China wished to respect the diversity of civilization, this is what he was talking about. He was resenting the universalism inherent within liberal political philosophy and stating that Russia and other countries would have to govern themselves according to their own value systems. Xi has echoed this sentiment. In another meeting between the two leaders, he reportedly told Putin that certain international forces are arbitrarily interfering in the internal affairs of China and Russia under the guise of democracy and human rights. By saying these things, both leaders were rejecting the notions of universalism that they see as a manifestation of Western hubris, with the United States as the chief offender. For Putin's Russia, these values have intruded on its traditional civilizational sphere of influence, which includes Ukraine. Putin sees Ukraine as part of not only Russia's political sphere of influence, but its cultural sphere as well. Under standard international norms, this worldview is a violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity, but Putin sees such norms as the very problem his invasion of Ukraine was meant to confront. This is the broader philosophical issue at stake in Ukraine. If Russia were to win at least a partial victory there and secure the territories it claimed to annex in the autumn of 2022, it would not only accomplish some of its geopolitical ambitions of establishing a better buffer for Crimea and the Volgograd Gap, it would also extend the Kremlin's claim of being the guarantor of Russian civilization and protector of Russian-speaking people, no matter where they reside. Other former Soviet states would be under greater pressure, especially if they have a lot of Russian speakers. A precedent would also be set for China's expansionist ambitions in the Indo-Pacific region. It would undoubtedly make China even more aggressive in its territorial claims. Taiwan is the most obvious target for Chinese expansion. As Beijing considers the self-governing island to be a renegade province, China's nine-dash line in the South China Sea is also an attempt for it to assert its civilizational sphere of influence in the region. China often justifies these expansive territorial claims by citing instances of its people's presence on the islands dating back to ancient times. Historians regard many of these claims as dubious, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague has entirely rejected the nine-dash line. However, that rejection itself is something that Xi considers an imposition based on Western norms of international relations that have little to do with China's experience or its proper historical sphere of influence. For China, these waterways are critical to its geopolitical security and its goal of pushing the United States out of the Indo-Pacific region, which it sees as its proper sphere of civilizational influence. This objective is a major plank in its ambition to become the world's leading superpower by 2049. In short, China and Russia share two important goals, reducing the power of the United States in international affairs and rejecting a global order based on liberal political ideology. To achieve these ends, they have entered into an era of unprecedented cooperation. Deep military ties go back to the 90s, when China began to import large amounts of Russian military equipment that aided in its arms buildup. This was an early indicator of the two nations' willingness to cooperate in the face of Western sanctions, as China was under such sanction following the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. China's purchase of Russian goods, meanwhile, were critical in keeping the latter's economy above water during the era of post-Soviet economic chaos. Meanwhile, once their border dispute was finally resolved, the two countries increased their participation in joint military exercises. These drills are designed to improve the readiness of both countries' armed forces and ensure they would be interoperable in the event of a confrontation with an enemy, almost certainly the United States. The two held their first joint military exercises in 2003 and have had more than 30 by the middle of 2021. 2022 and 3 saw cooperative exercises as well. For example, in July 2023, the two countries held a naval exercise in the Sea of Japan. The Russia-China exercise followed a trilateral set of drills 
between the United States, Japan, and South Korea to increase readiness in countering the North Korean missile threat. The Russo-Chinese drills, meanwhile, focused on missile and air defense, anti-submarine missions, and anti-ship missions. The operation was meant to send a message to the United States and its Asian allies, but it was also a valuable learning experience for China, which is still a fledgling sea power despite its huge naval buildup. China was particularly interested in learning how the Russian Navy countered Ukrainian threats at sea. For Russia, the exercise was a signal that it could still wield power in the Far East despite the grinding war in Ukraine. The two countries have also done naval exercises with Iran in the Indian Ocean. Other joint exercises between Russia and China include land operations in the Russian Far East, such as Vostok 2022. The two countries' air forces have also stepped up their cooperation. When President Biden visited East Asia with his Australian, Japanese, and Indian counterparts for a summit between the Quad leaders, China and Russia staged joint bomber exercises over Northeast Asia. It is not just massive exercises either. The two countries have increasingly done joint patrols, small-scale everyday operations to tie their militaries closer together. Sometimes Japan and South Korea have had to scramble jets in response. China and Russia have also cooperated closely in the diplomatic sphere. As permanent members of the UN Security Council, they often use their veto power, explicitly or implicitly, to protect one another and advance authoritarian interests around the world. For example, in early 2021, following a military coup in Myanmar, the two blocked the Security Council from passing a condemnation resolution. This was not a mere diplomatic show. Had the resolution passed, the UN could have taken steps like imposing comprehensive sanctions and arms embargoes. While any state can act unilaterally on these matters, actions from the UN would have had more robust international cooperation. China and Russia prevented that from happening. China in particular has close ties with Myanmar. It owns large oil and gas pipelines there and is creating the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor. China's state-run Xinhua News Agency referred to the coup as a cabinet shuffle. The two countries have also cooperated in protecting North Korea from additional international sanctions. More obviously, it is for these reasons that the UN cannot more comprehensively act on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, China's territorial expansion in the South China Sea, or on both of those countries' human rights abuses. They have paralyzed the mechanisms of power in the body through their influence. Since 2009, China and Russia have also worked closely to change international human rights norms. In 2020, the two countries joined the UN Human Rights Council, China has blocked NGOs seeking formal accreditation with the UN and has also sought to promote a right to development in the UN, at the expense of more traditional rights. In this way, it promotes its model of economic development with an authoritarian ruling regime. Xinjiang serves as the most notable example of the right to development, as in the name of economic growth, China has demolished traditional neighborhoods and engaged in acts against the native Uyghur Muslim population that the United States and other states around the world have formally classified as genocide. Russia, meanwhile, has used what it calls family and traditional values as alternatives to Western notions of human rights. China has assisted Russia in trying to incorporate this set of ideas into official UN doctrine. Both countries have been keen to sway developing countries in the global south to accept these norms of human rights, as opposed to ideas about democracy, the rule of law, and respect for the individual. Their goal is to create a parallel framework that authoritarian regimes around the world can mimic and use to justify their existence. Economically, China and Russia are trying to use their influence to undermine the dollar as the world's reserve currency, using forums like the BRICS and projects like Belt and Road. China and Russia have sidestepped sanctions by using the Chinese renminbi for commodity purchases, while the former pitches like-minded countries around the world on its currency, saying it's useful for avoiding dollar-linked sanctions. However, despite their seemingly warm relationship and supposed no-limits partnership, neither country is keen to make a formal military alliance with the other. Doing so would undoubtedly cement Russia as the junior figure in the arrangement. China, meanwhile, is not eager to give Russia military aid in Ukraine and risk Western sanctions, much less get involved in the fighting there. For all the talk about its opposition to the Western model of world order led by the United States, China relies on trade with America, Europe, and other liberal democratic nations, especially with its economic growth slowing. So far, it has proven unwilling to risk that trade for the sake of Russia, a revelation that has been much to Putin's disappointment. China's peace plan for Ukraine is also vague, 
It would leave open the possibility of Beijing's recognition of the territories Russia claimed to annex there, but it also pays homage to the notions of sovereignty and territorial integrity, meaning that China would be able to choose the option most convenient for it. Additionally, China and Russia still have historical resentments that never went away. They have just been masked due to the common interest in undermining the American-led global order. The former Soviet states in Central Asia have been one source of tension, as Moscow has always considered itself the preeminent player in the region. But China has increasingly muscled in on it in recent years, as it's crucial to Xi's Belt and Road Initiative. More importantly though, the war in Ukraine has left Russia very much dependent on China. Moscow is now accumulating a vast stockpile of renminbi reserves, which are not good for trade in many places outside of China. Beijing now has a far greater leverage over a Moscow cut off from the West, and this could be critical in the coming years. The Russian Far East has many of the resources that would prove useful to China, and with Chinese people emigrating to the area in large numbers, it would be characteristic for Beijing to use all of its advantages to the hilt and reassert its old territorial claims or at least force Russia to make deals with it there that are to its advantage. It would be a reversal of the events in the 19th century. Perhaps Xi and Putin have too much respect for each other to bring these possibilities to fruition, but they will not be the leaders of their respective countries forever. The lack of formal treaties and a true shared ideology, such as that seen in America's alliances, means that the new relationship between Moscow and Beijing will always in some ways be based on personality. Opposition to American power alone does not make for a lasting bilateral relationship. As Xi left the Kremlin at his summit meeting in March, he told Putin through his translator, Right now there are changes the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years, and we are the ones driving these changes together. What do you think about his words? Is the No Limits strategic partnership between China and Russia one that will create a new world order? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. The dragon has got its eyes set on Taiwan, and it means business. Xi Jinping has declared that reunification between Taiwan and the mainland is inevitable, and he has made the achievement of this goal by 2049 his top foreign policy priority. The Chinese dictator has repeatedly claimed that he seeks a peaceful reunification, However, he has also repeatedly stated that he will not renounce a military option to achieve this goal. In preparation for such a possibility, the People's Liberation Army PLA, has stepped up its saber-rattling against the island in recent years. What steps has China taken to prepare for war with Taiwan? In this video, we will look at the methods the Chinese military has used to slowly change the cross-strait status quo and what it means to finish the job by force should the need arise. China has long attempted to project power across the Taiwan Strait, resulting in successive crises there. Unfortunately for the mainland, all of these attempts have fallen short, partly because of the supremacy of the United States Navy and Air Force in the area. When Xi came to power in 2012, he made building a modern PLA capable of countering America's traditional military superiority one of his top priorities. Long maligned as a fighting force burdened with outdated equipment and lack of institutional expertise, partly thanks to Mao's purges, China's military is now much more formidable. In everything from missile technology to new fighter jets to aircraft carriers to an emphasis on recruiting the best and brightest from the country's top universities into the PLA's ranks, the Chinese armed forces are much more capable than they were a decade ago, let alone two decades ago or earlier. In 2021, United States military officials warned that China aimed to accelerate its armed forces modernization program to the point where it would be capable of successfully invading Taiwan by 2027 if it chose to do so. Previously, the target date had been 2035. As these comments came, China was in the process of stepping up its grey zone operations on Taiwan. By September 2020, with resistance to Beijing's authoritarianism in Hong Kong successfully brushed aside, the PLA put a renewed focus on Taiwan. Between then and December 2020, People's Liberation Army Air Force PLAAF aircraft had flown over 100 sorties in Taiwan's air defense identification zone, ADIS. 
A country's Adiz stretches beyond its internationally recognized airspace, but is still close enough for air traffic controllers to request incoming aircraft to identify themselves. In the years following 2020, China has further increased these grey zone operations. China has routinely set record incursions into Taiwan's Adiz and the area near it. In early October 2023, it set another record with a sortie of 103 fighter jets flying near Taiwan, with 40 of them entering the Adiz. In more dramatic examples of its grey zone operations, China has also practiced encircling the island with air and sea forces. After then-Speaker of the US House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan in the summer of 2022, China responded with a week-long series of live-fire air and naval exercises. These included missile launches demonstrating the ability to hit any target on the island, anti-submarine warfare drills, and sea raid rehearsals. When Pelosi's successor, Kevin McCarthy, visited Taiwan in April 2023, China again responded with large-scale exercises. This series included a simulated blockade of the entire island and simulated airstrikes from east of Taiwan. The drills included China's Shandong aircraft carrier as a participant. China has also demonstrated an increased capability of longer-range aerial missions around Taiwan by accompanying its fighter jets with its YF-20 aerial refueling tankers. Grey zone operations skirt the line between peaceful activity and wartime actions. These are repeat and deliberate encroachments designed to wear the enemy down on a psychological and physical basis. Admiral Li Si Ming, who was once Taiwan's highest ranked military officer, described the nature of these operations in a 2020 interview. You say it's your garden, but it turns out that it's your neighbor who's hanging out in the garden all the time. With that action, they are making a statement that it's their garden, and that garden is one step away from your house. To illustrate the point of the confusion between peaceful and wartime activity, China's grey zone operations include the use of weather balloons and civilian aircraft. These assets often come near Taiwan, but because they are not strictly military targets, it's proven difficult to develop a way to respond to them cohesively. Grey zone operations are effective over the long term. They were precisely how China established its military presence in the South China Sea. The increased Chinese military activity in the area forced its weaker neighbor, the Philippines, to lose control over the Scarborough Shoal in 2012. Increased military presence also forced the Philippines to back down over the disputed Spratly Islands. China's grey zone operations also raise questions about the willingness of the international community to risk escalation over seemingly trivial matters. For example, would the United States come to the Philippines' defense over a few shoals and rocks? The answer was no. China hopes that the continued grey zone operations around Taiwan will allow it to get its will in the same way, especially with America's turbulent domestic politics and a war-weary American public. Physically, China's grey zone operations around Taiwan increase the fatigue of the latter's military. Pilots must deal with the stress of repeat scrambles. Maintenance costs for aircraft and other military gear go up due to constant wear and tear in response to the unending Chinese sorties. The pressure has forced the Taiwanese government to increase the country's defense budget from $10.7 billion in 2018 to $16.9 billion in 2022. The global data analytics firm projects that Taiwan will spend over $18 billion on its defense by 2027. However, despite attempts to increase defense spending to 3% of GDP, Taiwan has been unable to do so, and the military budget remains around the 2% mark, which is lower than other countries friendly to the United States that have hostile neighbors. Why the constraint? It comes partially because Taiwan's economy is too small to afford such high levels of defense spending. Allocating 3% on defense means that important civilian needs would go unmet. Taiwan also has a low birth rate and an aging population, which presents challenges for filling its military ranks. About half of all Taiwan's defense spending goes to compensating personnel. With fewer personnel on hand, there will be a correspondingly smaller defense budget. As force size goes down, there will also be less facilities, equipment and purchases, which also shrinks the defense budget as a consequence, according to sources close to the Taiwanese military. It's probable that Taiwan will adapt to this and spend more money on unmanned systems. Its neighbor Japan plans to do precisely this in its military buildup. However, for now, Taiwan is still nowhere near capable of competing dollar for dollar with its hostile neighbor across the strait, whose real defense budget is likely close to 4% of its GDP. Since Xi took over the Chinese leadership, military spending, adjusted for inflation, has risen by 39%. 
By conducting its grey zone operations, China slowly wears down Taiwan without crossing the line to war and suffering the consequences of sanctions the way that Russia did when it invaded Ukraine. However, these extensive grey zone operations and military drills do not fall out of the sky. Such operations require the necessary support and as part of its build-up, China has built new infrastructure to support its military posture against Taiwan. As early as 2018, China began to make its intentions toward its supposed renegade province clear. Satellite imagery taken from April of that year showed that China was expanding its air base near the town of Xiapu in the Fujian province. Fujian is the province that lies directly across from Taiwan. The Chinese military was building 24 new aircraft shelters, taxiways and supporting buildings in the airbase that April. They were built in a semi-dispersed state, with four clusters of six aircraft shelters each. All of the new shelters were about 100 feet long by 60 wide, large enough to accommodate all of China's new and improved fighter jets. The dispersed formation of the aircraft shelters raised particular eyebrows as it was a departure from China's traditional practice of building shelters in straight lines and parking aircraft side to side. Instead, the new formation suggested that China had intentions on using the base in a frontline role with its own combat air brigade. New barracks were also constructed on the site, along with parking garages and testing and inspection facilities for vehicles. In early 2020, China began a vast range of new improvements to the two closest facilities to Taiwan, Longtian Air Base and Huan Air Base, which are 190 and 170 kilometers away from the island, respectively. Aircraft launched from these bases could reach the Taiwanese capital of Taipei in seven minutes. The PLAAF also began to stockpile Russian-made Mi-8 and Mi-17 helicopters at Longtian that year as part of preparations to upgrade the base. Longtian and Huan air bases also saw expanded and upgraded air defense sites as part of the newer rounds of improvements. The PLAAF was also building new hardened hangars for aircraft, which were all connected to the base's runway. Such a connection would permit for rapidity and ease of takeoff. The designs of the hangars, air defense sites, and shelters differed between the two bases, however, suggesting that the PLAAF may have different uses in mind for them. Longtian might be used more for refurbishment, while the new hardened hangars at Huan suggest that it would be used to support a brigade to conduct an invasion of Taiwan. The design of the fortifications seemed tailored to resist the HIMARS launchers and ammunition that Taiwan has purchased from the United States. China continued its military expansion in Fujian province in 2021. Google Earth images of PLAAF activity in the area revealed that in March, China improved and enlarged the runways in both Longqian and Huan. Huan saw three new storage bunkers for munitions and expansion of aprons to park fuel and load more aircraft. As part of the improvements to Longqian, China built an apron on the southern end of the base's main runway, adjacent to the aircraft shelters between 2020 and 2021. The headquarters of the PLA's Eastern Theatre Command, Zhangzhou Air Base, also in Fujian, saw improvements. It got new hangars and new expanded missile bases, capable of storing more weapons. Zhangzhou Air Base is about 400 kilometers away from Taiwan. The air bases and rocket bases along the southeastern coast of the mainland have been systematically upgraded. Infrastructure built in the 1980s to support China's old air fleet has been replaced with newer buildings to accommodate new fighter aircraft like the J-10, J-16 and J-20. Facilities to support China's new expanded arsenal of missiles are also part of these upgrades. 2022 saw additional improvements to Longqian. Satellite images taken on July 8th revealed more hardened aircraft shelters. The images also revealed a pair of flanker-type fighters, perhaps the J-16, between two rows of retired J-6 fighters that may have been converted to drones. Retired J-7 fighter jets have also been spotted on one of the base's aprons. These older planes have also reportedly been turned into drones. Earthen coverings were also spotted over some shelters, which might be built to store ammunition. However, they may have another purpose, because ammunition storage shelters are typically spaced further away from one another than the satellite images revealed. In order to prevent a chain reaction should one of them be damaged, the shelters look like drive-through buildings, suggesting to the open-source intelligence analyst known as at Detresfer underscore on X that the buildings could be used for preparing the supposed nearby drones for takeoff. 
J6 and J7 drones operating from Longqian could have multiple purposes. It's possible that they are training aircraft, but they could also be loaded with explosives and act as cheap cruise missiles that are ideal for an operation across the strait. Alternatively, they could have disposable electronic warfare suites that further confuse and stretch Taiwan's air defenses. Even if they are armed with nothing, their presence in the skies would distract other assets and likely prompt a response, depleting valuable ammunition. So far, China has not yet used these suspected drones as part of its grey zone operations, but it could be keeping its cards close to the chest. Naturally, Taiwan has viewed the expansion of these bases with great alarm. On September 12, 2023, Taiwan's defense ministry left little room for doubt about how it assesses the Chinese bases. The Chinese communists have been completing the expansion of airfields along the coastline of its eastern and southern theater commands, realigning new fighters and drones to be permanently stationed there. As a source of permanent forward presence, the expanded bases allow the PLAAF to gain operational experience in the skies they would need to fly in in case of an invasion, while presenting psychological challenges to Taiwan. The following week, Taiwan urged China to stop its destructive unilateral actions after increased military activity around the island. The bases nearest to Taiwan are not the only ones that China is upgrading to prepare for a potential war. The PLA's largest training base by physical size, the Zhuria Training Base in Inner Mongolia, has a full-size replica of downtown Taipei, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs building and the country's presidential office building. Sharia was established as a tank facility in 1957, but has since transformed into a multi-purpose facility to prepare for 21st century high-tech warfare. The facility began to modernize after China got the worst of the third Taiwan Strait crisis in 1996. By the mid-2000s, the base was emphasizing training PLA troops in urban warfare, probably in response to the American experience of counterinsurgency operations in Iraq. A decade later, the Taiwanese replica structures had been incorporated into Zhuri's architecture. The base also has a railhead to allow for the movement of vehicles, heavy weapons, and large numbers of personnel. Zhuri is also an operational air base. The construction of these facilities began in 2010. By the middle of the decade, the airbase had a 9,000-foot runway, 28 different helipads, and hangars to support the modern planes that the PLAAF was fielding. There are large spaces between these separate structures, designed to give enough room for tactical aircraft and helicopters to conduct integrated combined arms training. Construction crews on this base began building its generic urban environment in 2006. By 2013, construction began on the mock-up of Taipei. That particular function was completed in the following year. The fast construction does not seem to have reduced its quality, as it's one of the world's more elaborate urban warfare training facilities, according to analysts looking at the satellite imagery for the war zone. By 2015, images of the PLA drills against the Taiwanese presidential office building began to circulate online. Sharia even features a simulated Taiwanese airbase located south of the Taipei mock-up. These facilities were also built between 2013 and 2014. The original 3,900-foot runway expanded to 10,105 feet in 2017. The purpose of this model airbase is to help prepare PLA units for a takeover of these airfields in an actual military operation on the island. Zhuria is not the only location of facilities such as these. The PLA has also built a mock Taiwanese airbase in the Gansu province in northwestern China. This center was modeled on Taiwan's Qingchuan Kang airbase. Additional facilities were built in the Gobi Desert in the early 2010s. The sites included more mock-up airbases with hardened aircraft shelters. More famously, there were even outlines of American warships and structures or other assets located in the United States military's Japanese bases. The improved infrastructure allows China to prepare for a combined arms approach to military operations on Taiwan. The airbases in Fujian give China centers of forward operations around the island. The training facilities in the Chinese interior allow simulated air, artillery and ground attacks on Taiwanese targets. The Taiwanese have responded to China's improved bases, although their capability is comparatively meager. In 2023, the Taiwanese government approved two new military bases in northeastern Taiwan. The trend continued in January 2024, when the government said it would be spending $54.4 million to establish an additional two new missile bases on the east coast of the island, near Xincheng and Ji'an townships. These locations better shield them from the mainland's attacks and address the growing capability of the PLAN and PLAAF in the waters off Taiwan's Pacific coast, opposite the strait. Both bases are scheduled to be completed in 2026. 
Taiwan is also increasing its domestic missile production. Two of the new missiles include the Siang Feng 2 and Siang Feng 3 anti ship missiles, with subsonic and supersonic speeds respectively. The latter's long range version can reach distances of 400 kilometers. Both missiles will be completed by 2026. Taiwan is also making an air to air missile, which it claims will be superior to the American AIM 120 AMRAAM. This munition will be the Tian Chen 5 with a range of 160 kilometers. The 2026 date for the new missiles and bases is not coincidental. Taiwan wants to be ready before Xi Jinping's 2027 date for the PLA to have the capability of taking the island by force. Despite the militaristic posture seen in the expansion of the Chinese air bases, some security analysts caution that the new facilities do not mean that war with Taiwan is inevitable. However, the danger may be increasing. The Chinese economy is already showing signs of trouble. Its population has begun to decline. There are 35 million more men than women in the country as a result of the decades-long one-child policy. Xi and the rest of the Chinese Politburo are aware of these economic and demographic disadvantages, but have been unable to reverse them. China's domestic problems are likely to grow geometrically in the succeeding years. Meanwhile, problems are compounding for China abroad too. Japan is rearming. The United States military is increasingly entrenched in the Philippines. South Korea is becoming friendlier to Japan and cooperating in trilateral security arrangements with the latter and the United States under President Yoon suk yeol With such pressures, there is an elevated possibility that Beijing will determine it needs to make the move on Taiwan soon before the window closes. But will it? What do you think about China's grey zone operations and preparations for a potential invasion of Taiwan? Will Beijing make the move? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Here's a nerve-wracking question for you. Why has China been strengthening its military? Does the fastest military expansion since World War II and a campaign of non-military attacks suggest that China is already at war with the US? Or are the reasons for this more complex than meets the eye? In 1996, Taiwan held its first direct presidential election and transitioned to a fully-fledged democracy. This election set off the third Taiwan Strait crisis, with mainland China firing missiles across the water. In response, the United States sent two carrier battle groups to the area, with the USS Nimitz and her colleagues passing through the strait. Beijing had no choice but to back down in the face of this pressure. The incident, which came at the height of the American unipolar moment, is almost entirely forgotten in the United States today but Beijing always remembered. To the Chinese leadership, the crisis and its conclusion recalled the century of humiliation, the period between 1839 and 1949 where China repeatedly found itself invaded, dictated to, and partitioned by the Western powers and Japan. China vowed to never be at such a disadvantage again. 28 years later, with Taiwan having held another presidential election in January, the situation is vastly different. In this video, we will dive into the details of China's military buildup and how it's changed the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. In December 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization. This event was arguably more important to global politics than even the September 11th attacks, as China's entry into the WTO allowed it to entrench itself at the center of many of the world's most critical supply chains and become the world's largest trading and manufacturing nation. Beijing took advantage of the vast wealth accruing to its coffers to spend much more money on its military. Between 2000 and 2016, China's military budget increased at a 10% annual rate. Since then, the rate has slowed, but the military budget has still gone up by 5-7% per year. In 1995, at the beginning of the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, China wasn't even in the top 10 of worldwide military spenders. Even Taiwan spent more. By 2002, the first year after joining the WTO, China spent about $30 billion on its military, 10 times less than the United States, and was still behind the United Kingdom and Japan. 18 years later, China spent about $260 billion on its military, reducing the gap to about three times less than the United States. However, China's budget actually understates the amount that goes into its military, and China might be spending about $60 billion more per year on its armed forces than advertised. 
While the spending in absolute dollars still suggests the United States has a big advantage in the military balance of power, fundamentals beneath the hood suggest that China is eroding America's traditional dominance in ways disproportionate to the total spending. The United States' armed forces are stretched around the world in global commitments. Meanwhile, China can concentrate all of its military spending in the decisive Indo-Pacific region. This is not the only advantage China has. In 2022, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Major General Cameron Holt warned that China was acquiring weaponry at a rate five to six times faster than the United States. He further warned, in purchasing power parity, they spend about $1 to our $20 to get the same capability. We are going to lose if we can't figure out how to drop the cost and increase the speed in our defense supply chains. China's military buildup accelerated when Xi Jinping took power in 2012. Xi has an unusual personal interest in military affairs, at least in comparison with his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin. Unlike them, Xi holds the title of Commander-in-Chief of the Joint Operations Command Center, while China's People's Liberation Army has always been responsible to the Communist Party and its leader. The new title gives Xi Jinping command at the operational and field level that his predecessors didn't have. Xi also has strong personal and familial ties with the PLA that his predecessors lacked. His father, Xi Zhongzhong, was a military leader in World War II and the Civil War. Even Xi's wife, Pen Li Yuan, was a civilian member of the PLA with the rank equivalent to Major General. Many of those closest to him are also military men with deep ties to the institution. How has China built up its military? First, it has rapidly expanded its People's Liberation Army Navy in both numbers and capability. This was an innovation. China has traditionally been a land rather than a sea power, but its containment in the first island chain and its dependence on commercial shipping necessitated a change. With the first island chain full of American allies and choke points, vulnerable to being blocked by the United States Navy, the leadership in Beijing determined that it must have a stronger navy of its own. As late as 2010, China had no aircraft carriers. However, China had in 1998 purchased the sister ship of Russia's Admiral Kuznetsov carrier, and after a long odyssey, finally commissioned the ship as the Liaoning in 2012. In 2019, China launched the Shandong, its first domestically produced carrier based on the Liaoning. However, these two carriers use ski jumps called the Stobar system to launch their planes. This is slower than America's Nimitz and Ford-class carriers, which use a catapult system. Not wanting to be outdone, China launched the Fujian in 2022. This is China's first wholly domestically designed aircraft carrier, and like its American counterparts, it uses a catapult system. Tellingly, the Fujian was named after the province located across the strait from Taiwan. China has no plans to stop with the Fujian. It's currently building at least one more aircraft carrier, codenamed the Type 004. This carrier, which looks very similar to the US Navy's Gerald R. Ford, will be the first in China's fleet to operate on nuclear power, which will give it the ability to stay at sea for much longer durations than its predecessors and at much further ranges. Nuclear-powered ships also have an advantage in generating electricity needed to power advanced weapons and equipment. Some American national security experts believe that China could have five aircraft carriers by 2031, with the newer ones having nuclear propulsion to give them longer ranges and staying power at sea. China also now has the world's largest navy, with 426 hulls in its fleet as of November 2023. However, many of these vessels are not fit for frontline combat, as they are lighter and less well-armed. This is why despite China's fleet units, it still lags behind the United States Navy in terms of combined tonnage, with the US Navy being about twice as heavy. However, a decade ago, the US Navy had a 3 to 1 advantage over the PLAN in tonnage, which shows you how serious China is about closing the gap. The gap is closed partially because China is also building cruisers and destroyers at pace. By 2031, China could have 60 of these, with modern capabilities on similar par with the US Navy's equivalent ships. China is also modernizing its submarine force. This is the area of underwater warfare where China lags the furthest behind the United States. It has 72 submarines in its fleet, but only 15 are nuclear-powered, with six being ballistic missile submarines and an additional nine being conventional attack submarines. The others are diesel-electric submarines, which have less range, cannot dive as deep, 
and are noisier since they can only run on electric power for a short time. However, China is investing more heavily in its submarine fleet and plans to build two new types of submarines. The Type 095 nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine and the Type 096 ballistic missile submarine. In contrast to the Type 094, the Type 095 and 096 in particular are expected to be much quieter, thanks in part to sound isolation technology from Russia. This includes a raft attached to a rubber support system that reduces noise coming from the engine. There is still debate about the origin of this technology being outfitted to the much larger submarines under construction. However, these new underwater craft should at least be comparable to Russia's nuclear Akula-class submarines, the upgraded versions of which are already difficult to detect, according to Christopher Carlson of the US Naval War College. The PLAN is also gaining more experience on long overseas deployments. In 2008, Chinese naval flotillas were sent to the Gulf of Aden to conduct counter-piracy operations, a feat which has recurred over the years. After these missions, which tended to last for three months, the PLAN would sail to other theaters on much longer navigational missions before returning home. The PLAN has also seen frequent operations in the South China Sea, giving it more experience in waters further afield from the Chinese mainland. China's naval buildup is only part of its military modernization program. China has also taken pains to upgrade its air force, as late as the 2000s, China's People's Liberation Army Air Force relied on obsolete second-generation jet fighters like the Shenyang J-6. In addition to obsolete hardware, the PLAAF suffered severely during the Cultural Revolution, which closed many of its technical and maintenance training facilities, leaving it short of trained personnel, especially those who could keep the planes fit for flight. It took decades for China to recover from this disaster. However, the PLAAF has changed drastically since the start of the 2010s. Obsolete second- and third-generation fighters have been retired. In their place, three planes have taken the lead role in the PLAAF's fleet. These are the fourth-generation Chengdu J-10C, fourth-generation Shenyang J-16, and the fifth-generation Chengdu J-20. Between these three planes, China has 600 advanced aircraft in service, with plans to expand. Between 2020 and 2023, production rates of the J-16 and J-20 doubled. At current production rates, China could field as many as 1,000 J-20 planes by 2030. The J-20 has gotten some improvements as well. In 2022, China began upgrading the plane's engine to the WS-15. Previously, the J-20's engine was the Russian AL-31 that had been developed for the Su-34. As the fighters get outfitted with the new engine, the J-20 should be able to fly at supersonic speed without using its afterburners supercruise capacity. All three of these planes have AESA radars and can be equipped with the PL-15 air-to-air missile, which has a range of up to 300 kilometers. The J-20 in particular may also be getting drone wingmen. Although the details are sparse and must be treated with skepticism, these drones could allow the manned fighter to focus on specialized tasks like command and control. The drone, which would also be stealthy, could fire eight intelligent air-to-air -air missiles or loitering munitions, drones which linger over the battle space before attacking a target. The concept was revealed at the 2023 Zhuhai Air Show. Interestingly, the former obsolete fighters that the PLAAF was so well known for may be turned into drones themselves. Obsolete planes like the J-6 have been spotted by satellite imagery on military tarmacs despite their being retired. These drones would be easy to spot by radar if they were ever put into combat, but that is part of the point. In a scenario involving Taiwan, for example, these drones could act as a diversion that forces planes to scramble and ignore other areas more important for China's purposes, or they could simply be expendable tools designed to deplete ammunition. The concept has precedent. Starting in 2013, the USAF converted some obsolete F-16s into remotely controlled drones, the QF-16. Although this was done purely to turn them into aerial targets, China might see greater potential for this concept. China has also begun building a new type of air refueling tanker plane, the Y-20U, which made its maiden flight in 2018. The aircraft has three refueling points. The domestic engine to power this plane, the WS-20, is expected to enter production in 2024. China has also modernized its missile forces in arguably the most successful and strategically significant part of its buildup. As early as the late 90s, the Pentagon was worried about the buildup of China's air and missile forces, which it demonstrated early in the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis. 
reports in 1997 suggested that for Beijing, strengthening the accuracy of its ballistic and cruise missiles was a high priority and that within a decade, China could have as many as 1,000 new projectiles. Washington's expansion of its missile defense networks in Asia further convinced Beijing of the need for a stronger missile force. The May 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review cautioned that while the United States would face no peer competitor in the immediate future, by 2015, there would be the possibility of the emergence of a regional great power or global peer competitor. China now has more than 1,000 ballistic and cruise missiles. The closer one gets to the Chinese mainland, the more missiles there are to hit you. By 2021, China had between 750 and 1,500 short-range ballistic missiles, with ranges of up to 1,000 kilometers, putting Taiwan and every American base in Japan, South Korea, and the northern Philippines at risk. There were between 150 and 450 medium-range missiles, with ranges of 3,000 kilometers and 80 to 160 intermediate-range missiles, with ranges of up to 5,500 kilometers. These missiles put American bases further afield, like the southern Philippines and Guam, the largest in the region, at risk. China also has an unknown number of cruise missiles that pose additional danger to American bases and ships in the region. Hypersonic missiles have been another item of importance for the Chinese military. American officials have conceded that China currently leads in the hypersonic race. In 2018, Mike Griffin, then Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, claimed that China had conducted more hypersonic weapons tests than the United States over the preceding decade by a factor of 20 times. China deployed one such weapon into service, the DF-17, in 2019. The DF-17 is a road-mobile, medium-range ballistic missile outfitted with a hypersonic glide vehicle. China further showed its missile capability in the summer of 2021, when it tested a hypersonic device that flew around the world before hitting its target. This weapon was a combination of a fractional orbital bombardment system FOBS, with an HGV. This was only the most spectacular of China's many missile tests in recent years. In 2022, China conducted more ballistic missile tests than every other country in the world combined. China has also begun to expand its nuclear program. Between 2020 and 2022, it doubled its nuclear arsenal from about 200 to 400 warheads. At current production rates, China could have as many as 1,500 warheads by 2035. The new missiles and nuclear warheads as well as the Type 096 ballistic missile submarine, which would be able to launch projectiles from Chinese waters with a 9,000-kilometer range, demonstrate China's much-improved nuclear capability. In the past, China maintained a program of limited nuclear deterrence. That's now beginning to change, showing Beijing's anticipation of strategic competition with Washington. However, any kind of military equipment, no matter how technologically advanced, is useless without the proper people operating it. That's why China is focusing its military buildup on personnel as much as it is on weapons or technology. In anticipation of a high-tech military, Beijing has launched a recruitment drive seeking to bring the country's best and brightest. Military recruiters have stepped up their presence in China's schools in a bid to bring bright young graduates into service. Military recruiters have especially been keen on enlisting STEM majors in the country's university. The PLA wants 70% of its new recruits to hold at least a university undergraduate degree. As part of its recruitment goals, China increased military salaries by 40% in January 2023. The PLA also offers job security, and Chinese enterprises, especially state-owned ones, tend to give preferential treatment in hiring to discharge soldiers over those with no military experience. Veterans of the PLA will also be allowed to return to combat positions upon re-enlistment. While the recruiting drive seems to be working at keeping the active PLA personnel at a steady 2 million, the world's largest standing army, it's not all smooth sailing. According to China's own polling, only 35% of soldiers who completed their service in the PLA wanted to stay there instead of being discharged to the reserves. College graduates stayed at even lower rates, so while China has made progress in improving the quality of recruits to its military, it will need to take further steps to make it more attractive to the country's most talented minds for the long haul. Like in many other sectors, China also has corruption in its military ranks. As we've seen with Russia's experience in Ukraine, corruption within a military, especially in its logistics, can manifest deadly consequences on the battlefield. Therefore, part of China's military modernization involves rooting out corruption. 
As part of his anti-corruption efforts after taking office, Xi Jinping initiated a crackdown in the PLA. In 2013, his first full year, 4,024 officers, including 82 generals, were investigated, with 21 being removed. The following year, 16 senior officers were investigated. Zhu Kaihu and Guo Boksheng, who were both former vice chairmen of the Central Military Commission, were investigated and jailed. Although many Western observers have wondered whether corruption in the PLA would impede China's operations the way that corruption among Russia's military ranks has, the low number of officers investigated, less than 1% of the PLA's total, likely means that it will not be as important. Xi continues to claim that anti-corruption is an important part of his military modernization program. In 2018, Xi launched a new anti-corruption drive to ensure that training data would not be falsified. Military discipline officers were sent to the Army's five theater commands to monitor drills. The drive was meant to increase the effectiveness of the PLA's training, which included frequent live-fire drills based on lessons learned from Western fighting forces, especially those of the United States. Xi has also made combat-ready training a priority for his military buildup. This objective is reflected in the PLA's frequent exercises with Russia. Before the mid-2000s, Chinese military drills with Russia were rare, amid lingering border disputes from the Cold War. Since then, they have become more frequent, with China increasingly playing a leading role in comparison to its strategic partner. Other exercises have also included far-afield drills with Iran. For example, in March 2023, the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian navies conducted naval exercises near the latter's coast. Xi's emphasis on corruption-free training is especially important if China's buildup is to succeed, because the PLA has lacked real combat experience since the 1979 border war with Vietnam, where it did not perform well. Training with other forces, especially those with combat experience, is a vital component for Xi's vision of a modern, first-rate Chinese military. Even though there are lingering problems, such as a serious shortage of trained naval aviators, lack of recent combat experience, and certain missing components needed for long-range power projection, such as only about two dozen tankers based on 1950s Soviet designs, China's military has come a very long way in the last decade, let alone since the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis. At that time, China was still regarded as a military backwater lacking in power compared to the United Kingdom, France, and even a Russia in post-Soviet transition. The PLA was often reliant on Russian technology and completely lacked the know-how to make modern equipment. That is no longer the case. The military buildup, especially under Xi Jinping, has made China a would-be regional great power in exactly the timetable that the 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review predicted. China has greater aspirations still with Xi setting a date of 2049 to reunify with Taiwan and become the world's leading military power. But will China succeed in this goal? Or will economic, demographic and other institutional problems prevent this from occurring? Or are there many more problems under the hood for China's military? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. If the nightmare scenario of World War III were to become reality, where would the hostilities break out? Could it come near the shores of the Baltic Sea, with Russia trying to regain some of its prestige in the region after an embarrassing performance in Ukraine? Could it be in the Middle East with a renewed Iranian nuclear program? Or perhaps it could come from renewed hostilities on the Korean Peninsula, which is still technically in a state of war. Or maybe China decides to risk everything on an invasion of Taiwan. These are all potential hotspots, but the likeliest one could be in the South China Sea, where China has expanded its military presence for a decade and alienated all of its neighbors in the region, who also claim these waters and their islands. Could World War III break out in the South China Sea? If so, why? Let's take a look at the importance of this region, the basis of China's territorial ambitions in it, and how likely a confrontation might actually be. The South China Sea, which stretches from the Strait of Malacca in the west to the Strait of Taiwan in the east, is a rich target for any would-be great power to exploit. It is abundant in resources. There are at least 11 billion barrels of oil and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in these islands and waterways. The South China Sea is also home to some of the world's richest fisheries, providing about 15% of the world's total fishing potential. Rare earth metals such as yttrium, which are so vital to the modern digital economy, can also be found in the South China Sea. 
In addition to its natural resources, the area is one of the most vital crossroads of world trade. As of 2021, about $5.3 trillion, about 2022% of annual global trade, passed through the South China Sea's shipping lanes, including 40% of the world's petroleum products, 60% of its maritime trade, and a third of the world's total shipping. Some of the world's biggest economies depend on this trade too. For example, 42% of Japan's total trade comes through this region. This is a rich prize for any aspiring superpower. When considering why China wants the South China Sea so badly, it is also important to note that it is a food-insecure nation. It depends heavily on foreign food imports. In 2017, China imported $104.5 billion worth of food and exported only about $60 billion. In terms of grain production, Chinese agriculture has achieved a one-to-one -one production to consumption ratio. However, it lags behind its rivals like the United States and Australia, which produce 1.4 times more grain than they consume. Additionally, China's economic growth has created a large middle class with more sophisticated food demands such as meat and dairy, which are more resource intensive. It needs to import from foreign sources to fulfill the demands of its population. It does not help that China has a relatively low amount of arable land at 0.21 acres per capita. Environmental damage from decades of communist mismanagement makes matters worse. 15.5% of China's groundwater is so polluted that it cannot be used in any setting, and widespread soil contamination has destroyed millions of acres of otherwise arable land, especially in the country's southern provinces. Meanwhile, over a million Chinese hogs were slaughtered to contain the spread of African swine fever, and domestic pork production fell by 21.3% in 2019. Meanwhile, pork imports from the United States increased by 258%. To make matters worse for Beijing, even though China is the world's largest producer and exporter of fish, it is also still the world's third largest fish importer, and Chinese fisheries have been stressed by overfishing. In 2013, the Chinese leadership acknowledged that the country would require moderate imports of food to meet its consumption needs. In this light, it is not surprising that China would want to increase its food security. Seizing the fisheries in the South China Sea is only the most obvious method of expansion of its food production capacity. Controlling the shipping that is so vital to its food supply is a no-brainer for Beijing. China also became the world's biggest energy consumer in 2010. In 2013, China became the world's largest net importer of crude oil, and its energy demands have only grown in the decades since. It must remain able to access the South China Sea's shipping lanes to ensure this energy supply. Bottom line, whoever controls the South China Sea also controls its resources and the economies of the nations that rely on the shipping that goes through its waters. It is therefore not surprising that China made moves to expand its influence in the region when its military became more capable. How has China justified these moves? Beijing cites historical reasons. Its modern claims on 90% of the South China Sea's waterways are based on the so-called Nine Dash Line Map. The map originated in 1947, when, in the aftermath of World War II, a Chinese cartographer named Yang Huiren drew a map of 11 dashes, which extended from the waters east of Taiwan through the South China Sea almost to Malaysia and up the Vietnamese coastline all the way to the Gulf of Tonkin. This map was drawn under the nationalist government, which ruled the then Republic of China. Two years later, the Communist Party of China, led by Mao Zedong, overthrew the nationalists and took control of the Chinese mainland. Mao subsequently redrew the map to nine dashes and abandoned the claim on the Gulf of Tonkin, but the basic scheme remained intact. China tries to justify the nine dash line's legitimacy on historical grounds. It claims that it was the great power in the area and had run the waters before it suffered from unjust imperialism at the hands of the Western powers and Japan in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Records of Chinese control and development of the Spratly Islands in particular supposedly stretch back to the 2nd century BC. More concrete Chinese claims come from the Cairo and Potsdam declarations during and after World War II. These supposedly had China reclaiming sovereignty in the South China Sea's islands. The formal peace treaty with Japan in 1951 and the San Francisco Conference Statement in 1958 also had China reiterating 
that the South China Sea territory was its own. However, these claims were and are regarded as unfounded by the international community. The dispute in the South China Sea therefore gives credence to the realist theory of international relations, where self-interested states compete with one another in an anarchical environment. China's claim on the area are unrecognized, so it is asserting itself by force and daring anyone to try and stop its ambitions. After all, there is no policeman to call on in an international setting and no court of law with any real power beyond what states themselves give it, as we will soon see. The 11 and 9 dash line maps were of little consequence in the first few decades after they were drawn. China had suffered from nearly 150 years of invasion, civil war, and the famines and purges Mao imposed with the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. China was therefore in no position to enforce the claims of its Nine Dash Line. However, Beijing indicated early on that it was willing to use force to back up its otherwise spurious claims. In 1974, China seized control of the Paracel Islands from the then existing country of South Vietnam, killing more than 70 South Vietnamese troops in the process. The following year, the Vietnam War ended and the country reunified under the North's rule and the North inherited the claim to the Paracels, which it disputes with China to this day. The Paracels are relatively close to the Hainan Island, which is officially recognized Chinese territory. But as China got economically and militarily stronger after Mao's death in 1976, it got bolder in enforcing its claims further afield. In 1988, China and Vietnam fought in the Spratlys and Vietnam again got the worst of the engagement, suffering the loss of 60 sailors and three ships. China also fought with the Philippines in the Mischief Reef incident of 1996, where three ships from the Chinese Navy fought a 90-minute battle with a Filipino gunboat in the Spratly Islands. However, China's modern posture in the South China Sea dates to 2012, when it unilaterally seized control of the Scarborough Shoal a territory in the Philippines recognized exclusive economic zone. Standoffs and warning shots between China and the Philippines had occurred in 2011, but the situation escalated dramatically in April 2012. On the 8th, a Filipino Navy surveillance plane spotted eight Chinese fishing boats in the Scarborough Shoal. On the 11th, the Filipino Navy had a standoff with China's Navy. China eventually won this contest when, on July 18th, it blocked Filipino ships and fishing boats from entering the Scarborough Shoals Lagoon. It has effectively administered the area ever since. The Philippines took China to the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague in 2013, and in 2016, the court ruled in the former's favor, dismissing any claim that China had over the territory in the South China Sea and invalidating the Nine Dash Line entirely. Did this stop China from advancing its claims in the area? You know the answer to that. Beijing's attitude was that the court made its ruling good luck in enforcing it. China not only disregarded the international court's ruling, but it accelerated its plans to dominate the South China Sea. From 2013 to 15, it began building artificial islands in its positions in the Spratly Islands. It soon began militarizing these areas. In March 2022, US Indo-Pacific Commander Admiral John C. Aquilino announced that China had fully militarized at least three of the islands it had built several years earlier. These islands were Fiery Cross Reef, Mischief Reef, and Subi Reef. The new fortresses boasted airfields with fighter jets and which were even capable of hosting bombers. The islands also housed anti-ship and anti-aircraft missile systems. Laser and jamming equipment were also features in these islands. The military buildup came partially in response to the United States Freedom of Navigation Operations FONOPS, in the area. These operations and China's response to them pose one of the biggest risks for war. In 2022, Aquilino was in the thick of the action. He spoke with the Associated Press reporters on a US Navy reconnaissance plane, a P-8A Poseidon, that flew close to the Chinese island fortresses. Chinese military personnel contacted the plane and warned it to leave. China has sovereignty over the Spratly Islands, as well as surrounding maritime areas. Stay away immediately to avoid misjudgment. The American pilot responded like so. I am a sovereign, immune United States naval aircraft conducting lawful military activities beyond the national airspace of any coastal state. Exercising these rights is guaranteed by international law, and I am operating with due regard to the rights and duties of all states." The implication was obvious. China claims that the islands it built are its territory and that it has the right to defend them. 
the United States says that they are not, and proceed under the assumption that they are not. Maintaining freedom of trade and navigation on the world's waterways has long been one of the United States military's primary missions. To maintain freedom of navigation in the South China Sea and deter China from growing even more aggressive there, the United States has conducted its FONOPS since 2015. These operations can take one of two forms. In the first form, they may simply be transit exercises. In the second, they may be explicit military exercises. The United States does not notify or seek China's approval when it conducts these operations within its supposed Nine-Line territory. In other words, the FONOPs are a direct challenge to China's claimed sovereignty in the South China Sea, showing that the United States regards these claims as nothing more than illegitimate bluster on the part of Beijing. This is a game of brinksmanship. Who will blink first? So far, it's been China, but there is no guarantee that that will continue forever. In its first FONOP on October 27, 2015, the destroyer USS Lassen came within 12 nautical miles of features in the Spratly Islands claimed by China, Vietnam, Taiwan, and the Philippines. Although the FONOP was technically designed to counter all of these expansive territorial claims, everybody understood who the real recipient of the message was supposed to be. Similar operations have taken place since then, and they have increased as the years have gone by. The Chinese Navy soon challenged America's FONOPs, and there have been numerous close calls. In 2018, there was a near collision between a US Navy destroyer and a Chinese warship when the latter tried to block the American vessel's path. This close call was avoided, but Chinese naval ships have become more aggressive in tailing and disputing the US Navy as it sails past what they claim are Chinese territorial waters and islands. The risk for escalation increases when one considers that ship captains have a relatively high degree of autonomy. For example, equipment failure might make a captain feel like his vessel is under threat. Faulty communications, equipment or radars could present an incomplete picture of events, giving the ship's captain what he believes are limited options to protect the vessel and its crew. In such confusion, human nature tends to default to assuming the worst. There is precedent for a close call between the US and Chinese armed forces. In April 2001, an American reconnaissance plane collided with a Chinese fighter and was forced to make an emergency landing on Hainan Island. China detained the plane's crew for 11 days as Washington and Beijing blamed each other for the incident and disagreed over the terms of a resolution. Both sides tried to be accommodating and the incident was resolved without too much controversy in the end, to the point that it's nearly forgotten today. If a similar incident occurred now, the story could be very different. Understandably, this prospect makes military and foreign policy experts nervous. Some have called for an end to the US military's FONOPs in the South China Sea, arguing that they have failed and that the risks exceed the benefits. They argue that the cost of upholding international norms through military means has increased to a level that is too high and that the American public would not be willing to pay. Instead, these experts argue that the United States should use economic leverage to force China to change its behavior. There is recent precedent for this. In 2020, the United States Commerce Department sanctioned 24 Chinese companies for their behavior in the South China Sea, prohibiting the sale of certain exported goods. The State Department joined in the effort and announced that individuals in those companies would also be prohibited from obtaining visas to enter the United States. However, there are severe limits to this approach. Most of the companies in question did not source any of their materials from the United States, and the visa restrictions are altogether toothless. It's hard to conclude that completely ceding the military realm in the South China Sea to China's much less capable neighbors will encourage Beijing to alter its expansionist policy in the region. To add to these diplomatic and military tensions, there are also matters of national and cultural pride among the South China Sea's disputants. The Nine Dash Line has become a matter of national pride among the Chinese public over the last decade. To them, it is a sign that the period of humiliation, poverty and revolution are over, and that China is at last retaking its rightful place at the hegemon of Asia. For China's neighbors, the issue is similarly sensitive. In the summer of 2023, Vietnam banned Barbie from its movie theaters over a scene with a map in the background that supposedly depicted China's Nine Dash Line. Vietnam and the Philippines banned the movie Uncharted in 2022 for the same reason, 
Vietnam, the Philippines, and Malaysia banned the 2019 movie Abominable, again for the same reason. For these countries, which also claim the South China Sea but do not have the military means to back up their assertions, sensitivity about their disadvantage is naturally elevated. With national pride on the line, there are additional emotional stakes in the South China Sea conflict. The United States, which is approaching the dispute from strategic and economic perspectives, will need to take such cultural considerations into account as it makes its policy there to counter China's hegemonic ambitions. The United States is keen to make alliances with other countries in the area to prevent China from taking control of the South China Sea's shipping lanes. This strategy began with the reinvigoration of the quadrilateral security dialogue during the Trump years. The United States and its Quad partners Australia, Japan, and India committed to maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific. China has repeatedly protested the Quad and considers it a threat. Meanwhile, the United States has renewed its long-standing military ties with the Philippines and is building new army, air, and naval bases in that country. This is bad news for China, which was hoping to court the Philippines into its orbit. Despite the bitter South China Sea dispute, Rodrigo Duterte, who was president of the Philippines from 2016 to 22, maintained a friendlier policy toward China, in hopes of making his country less dependent on the United States. His successor, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., has reversed this policy and allowed the U.S. military a greater presence in the Philippines. The United States has also been steadily improving its bilateral relations with Vietnam. Although there are no formal military ties between the two countries yet, that could change in the future as China continues to get more aggressive with its claims in the area. The United States has not taken the side of the Philippines, Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, or any other power in the area with excessive maritime claims. Indeed, it does not support any of these and seeks to maintain freedom of navigation in the area. However, none of these countries have the ability to shut such navigation down. China does, and containing its ambitions in the South China Sea is the common interest that they all share. In possibly the most famous part of his History of the Peloponnesian War, the Melian Dialogue, the Athenians told the city of Melos that they had two choices, submit or suffer the consequences. In contrast to the Melians' talk about what would amount to international law today, the Athenians responded only that they had an interest in Melos and would be acting accordingly. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. We have seen this ancient dynamic in play in the South China Sea, with China acting in a similar manner, with China unlikely to change its behavior anytime soon, and with the economic, geostrategic, and cultural stakes involved, it's far from a stretch to think that war could break out in this region. Perhaps an American FONOP goes very wrong, or perhaps China uses its bases in the region to launch a much greater offensive in disputed territories. However it happens, the consequences would be catastrophic, and an accident here is much more likely than an accident over Taiwan. But what do you think about the South China Sea dispute? Is it the place where World War III is likeliest to break out? Is there a way to resolve the matter peacefully? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. A potential hostile encounter with China now dominates the United States military planning, and vice versa. What would a war look like? Who would win? Before we get to that, let's take a minute to explain why our military experts have decided to discuss this potentially very real and, quite frankly, terrifying scenario. After the end of World War II and especially the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the United States emerged as the world's preeminent power, supreme in military, economic, technological, and even cultural influence. After 1991, the United States was so strong that some experts believed it had transcended superpower status. According to their theory, it had instead ascended into a hyperpower, a state that dominates all other states in every domain in the international system. The world had become a unipolar one, even leading some observers in the 1990s and part of the 2000s, most famously Francis Fukuyama, to declare an end of history and the final triumph of liberal democracy as the last form of human political organization. However, the 2000s and 2010s threw some cold water on this theory. Costly American military expeditions in the Middle East, the 2008 financial crisis, Russia's expansionist ambitions under Vladimir Putin, Iran and North Korea's nuclear programs, and above all, the economic and military rise of China. 
all undermine the notion of unipolarity. By the middle of the 2010s, the Pentagon proposed its third offset strategy, which tacitly acknowledged that the unipolar moment was, if not over, at least under threat by the emerging coalition of authoritarian powers, led by China, who were opposed to the international order led by the United States. The United States was therefore shifting its military posture away from the counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency campaigns which dominated its strategy following 9-11, when the unipolar moment was near its height, and toward competition with and deterrence of other states, especially China. This is why the US is currently heavily oriented toward preparing for a potential adversarial encounter with China. Let's dive into what kind of conflict might unfold and which side could emerge victorious. We can begin with a comparison of the size of the two forces. With 1.4 billion people, China is the second most populous country in the world, having been surpassed by India in April 2023. It has the world's largest military with almost 2.2 million active personnel. The United States military ranks third in size with almost 1.4 million active duty personnel. When adding in reservists, the numbers increase to 3.35 million and 2.2 million, respectively. China also has the world's largest navy, with 425 fleet units in its active naval inventory as of August 21, 2023. This number excludes smaller patrol ships and other auxiliaries, presumably its huge fishing fleet that has acted as a de facto maritime militia in disputed waters. Meanwhile, the United States has 243 units in its active naval inventory, excluding smaller patrol ships and other auxiliaries. The United States has the world's largest air force, with 5,217 active aircraft as of 2022. China ranks a distant third, with 1,991. When counting the total number of military aircraft with all branches combined, China's numerical disadvantage in the skies becomes more pronounced, as the United States has 13,247 aircraft among all of its military branches while China ranks a very distant third again at 3,285. When it comes to air power at sea, the United States has 2,464 aircraft, while China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, has only 437. This is an important distinction and reveals that many of China's advantages are only surface deep. The numerical difference in the makeup of the two forces is important. A war between the United States and China would take place in the area close to the Chinese mainland, in the territory around the first island chain, a string of countries that stretch from Japan to Indonesia. China would be able to concentrate all of its resources there, and its supply lines would be much shorter. In contrast, the United States has global commitments, with Russia exerting pressure on Eastern Europe, Iran and its allies in the Middle East, and North Korea on the Korean Peninsula. All of these hotspots demand America's attention, the United States would also need to ship its supplies and replacements across the Pacific. These supply lines would be long and vulnerable to attack, the tyranny of distance. The United States has qualitative advantages, however. China's army has not seen major combat operations in almost half a century. The last time was the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, where the PLA had a poor showing indeed against the Vietnamese. In contrast, the United States military has had decades of combat experience and a buildup of institutional knowledge that the PLA simply does not have. It has more experienced soldiers, sailors, marines, and officers. The Chinese military has engaged in a large buildup and conducted extensive drills and war games with partners such as Russia, but there is no substitute for the real thing. Russia's poor performance in Ukraine shows that, and its armed forces had more experience than China's currently does. The United States Air Force not only has numerical superiority over the People's Liberation Army Air Force, but a qualitative advantage in those planes. Although it may not seem this way at first, China has one fifth-generation fighter jet, the Chengdu J-20. China may have over 200 of these in service, a number which could hit as high as 1,000 by 2030 if current production rates continue. It may also have over 240 of the advanced fourth-generation plus J-16 fighters in service. This is a formidable force for the PLAAF. In contrast, the United States has only built 187 of its best fifth-generation fighter jets, the F-22 Raptor. The last one was delivered in 2012, and the Air Force has no plans to order any more. However, the United States can supplement the extremely high-quality Raptor with the fifth-generation F-35 Lightning II. 
Over 960 F-35s have been delivered as of August 2023. The United States also has thousands of advanced fourth-generation fighter jets like the F-15 Eagle, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-18 Super Hornet available. And all of them come with better trained and more experienced pilots than their Chinese counterparts. Although China has closed the gap, the United States is still supreme in the world's skies, and in an all-out air battle, the Americans would eventually establish air superiority. The war at sea is also not favorable to China. The People's Liberation Army Navy may have a bigger fleet in terms of sheer numbers, but the United States Navy has purposely chosen to pursue a different strategy than its Chinese counterpart. Numbers aren't everything. Many of the Chinese vessels are small and would prove relatively poor in a military confrontation. In contrast, the USN operates sturdier, more powerful vessels. For example, the PLAN has three aircraft carriers, only one of which uses a modern catapult system. The USN has 11, all of which are more modern than the first two Chinese carriers. China has plans to make more aircraft carriers in the years to come, but as of now, the United States has a significant advantage. Additionally, China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators. The PLAN is trying its best to catch up, but it's still far short. As a conflict between the United States and China would mainly be fought in the seas and skies around the first island chain, with comparatively limited land operations, the traditional balance of power should favor the United States in a head-to-head -head confrontation. However, China has recognized this and has adapted with a strategy of anti-access area denial, A2AD. One of the things that marked the United States' emergence as a supposed hyperpower following the end of the Cold War was its ability to project power anywhere on the globe within hours. Perhaps one of the best examples was the Navy SEAL raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in 2011. This complicated military operation occurred without the Pakistani government's knowledge, and there was little that Pakistan could do about it except raise a protest afterward. After the end of the Cold War, the United States had no peer competitor in the international system, which could prevent it from using its military resources in the way it wanted. However, this began to change with China's military buildup. China's A2AD strategy sounds complicated, but it's relatively simple. First, it is to deny its adversaries freedom of movement in the disputed region, anti-access. To do this, it will utilize certain assets, especially cheap precision ballistic and cruise missiles, to destroy key targets in offensive strikes. The second leg of the strategy is to use defensive systems to deny the enemy the ability to operate in territory controlled by it or other friendly powers. For example, China would try to use its stockpile of thousands of cheap ballistic missiles to destroy expensive American ships, especially aircraft carriers, bases, and long supply lines to prevent the United States from moving into disputed regions like the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait. Cheap ballistic missiles destroying expensive carrier groups would not only prove deadly and costly, it would prevent the United States from being able to project its power into the first island chain and the Chinese interior. This is the opposite of what happened during the third Taiwan Strait crisis in 1995-96. When the United States sent two carrier groups to the area, the Chinese did not have the resources to deal with this projection of American power and had to back down. The story would be very different today, and the move far more dangerous on the part of the United States. Chinese air and missile attacks on US naval assets, supply lines, and bases in Japan, South Korea, and even as far out as Guam would take advantage of the tyranny of distance to prevent the United States from being able to fight the war for the long haul. The United States might be able to establish air and naval superiority with its higher quality planes and ships in a confrontation, but it could have a hard time replacing losses and bringing more resources over. Meanwhile, China would be operating close to its own territory. The supply lines would be much shorter and easier to defend with its air and sea defense systems and all of China's resources would be concentrated here. In addition to these kinetic assets, China has tried to develop its electronic and cybernetic warfare capabilities to further disrupt the US military capability. China's military buildup and its A2AD weapons has posed the most serious challenge to US military might since the Cold War. It is why many experts believe that the United States is slowly but steadily losing its traditional military superiority in the Indo-Pacific region. To defeat China's A2AD strategy, the Pentagon developed its third offset strategy, 
China hopes that the development of advanced A2AD capabilities will deter the United States from even disputing its expansionist moves. This is why for the Pentagon, it is important to maintain forward presence capability. It must be able to defeat the attempts to impede the movement of American military forces and surge them forward in a combat-credible posture. According to the U.S. Army's Center for Lessons Learned, the third offset strategy involves forces that are or can rapidly get forward, survive a withering Chinese or Russian assault, and blunt the adversary's aggression. It is almost reminiscent of a boxer trying to duck and slip past a barrage of long jabs to get inside his opponent's range and deliver power blows. The United States is currently developing technologies to better prepare it to pursue this strategy. For example, these new technologies would involve better artificial intelligence to enable human officers to make faster and more informed decisions. The integration of human and unmanned platforms, like the Sea Hunter autonomous drone ship, would also be part of the third offset strategy. Other technologies like ship-borne hypersonic missiles and the Helios laser system can also be considered part of the third offset strategy, as it is hoped that the laser will add a layer of protection to the US Navy's ships from the Chinese ballistic and cruise missile threat. The laser is also ideal for countering drones. The first Helios laser began seeing service in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022, and the Navy requested $35 million in its 2023 budget for Helios systems, when they will begin to become operational at sea. However, as dazzling as the third offset strategy technologies are, they are still works in progress. The United States neglected countermeasures against China's A2AD strategy as it pursued its counterinsurgency and counterterrorism efforts in the War on Terror. Under current conditions, the United States military still uses many technologies and systems that are not well designed to counter the strategy China is pursuing. China still cannot defeat the United States in a head-to-head -head military confrontation, but because of geography, it does not necessarily need to. All it needs to do is prevent the United States from projecting enough power past the first island chain to defeat its expansionist ambitions. As part of its strategy, American military bases in Japan would be targeted in the opening shots of the war, to destroy troops and equipment, prevent the stockpiling of supplies, and disrupt the United States' strategy in the region. Air defense systems would take down some of the incoming missiles, but China has thousands in its arsenal, and its attacks would certainly do a great deal of damage. War games done at the Pentagon and defense think tanks have repeatedly confirmed these disadvantages. In a January 2023 scenario run by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the United States, with the help of Japan and Taiwan, defeated an amphibious invasion of Taiwan. But the casualties were enormous, with losses in dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and tens of thousands of military personnel, with the U.S. position on the international stage undermined for years afterward. China suffered heavily too, however CSIS warned that deterrence needed to be strengthened immediately. Other war games were even less kind. A 2020 war game run by the Pentagon over Taiwan and other scenarios had the United States failing miserably because gathering ships, aircraft, and other forces in a way that would let them reinforce one another made them sitting ducks for Chinese missile attacks. To make matters worse, the United States lost access to its electronic networks from the get-go upending the information dominance strategy it has used so successfully starting in the Gulf War. In response to the 2020 war game, the Pentagon is looking to shore up its contested logistics, possibly through the use of rockets to fly above the war zone. It's also looking to find ways to aggregate power virtually rather than physically. Then Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General John Hyten said of it, you have to aggregate the mass fires, but it doesn't have to be a physical aggregation. It could be a virtual aggregation for multiple domains. Acting at the same time under a single command structure allows the fire to come in on anybody. It allows you to disaggregate to survive. He admitted this was exceedingly difficult to do, however. Finally, the United States would need to improve the defense of its networks against hackers with a hacker-proof combat cloud. For now, though, these things are only speculation. What is not, however, is the United States' advantage in submarine warfare. China's missile capability has made it increasingly dangerous for the United States and its allies to project power behind the first island chain with surface ships, but the submarine force is much better protected. That's why China raised such a big protest about the AUKUS deal that would give Australia nuclear-powered submarines. Submarines are ideal for the implementation of the United States' third offset strategy. American nuclear-powered submarines can operate for months they are quiet and dive deep, 
making them difficult to detect. They can also launch conventional or nuclear-armed ballistic or cruise missiles to strike sensitive targets. The United States submarine fleet would make any invasion of Taiwan or other amphibious operations in the first island chain a costly proposition for the Chinese military. The presence of these submarines also gives the United States significant conventional or nuclear first strike options to attack targets on land, such as Chinese military installations, which house the ballistic missiles that are such a threat to surface ships and land bases. China's PLAN is trying to close the submarine gap. At the moment, though, the bulk of its underwater fleet consists of diesel-electric submarines. They are quieter than nuclear submarines when running on electric power, but most surface to charge their batteries and are much louder when running on diesel power during this process. As of March 2023, China has a fleet of 56 submarines, but only six of them are nuclear-powered. The disparity means that the United States can carry out stealthier and longer operations under the water than China's navy can. If a war did break out between the United States and China, the US submarine fleet would swing into action and attack Chinese naval assets, land bases and shipping. The latter is especially important and reveals the United States' ace in the hole. China depends heavily on foreign food and energy imports. From its perspective, China's attempt to expand its influence in the South China Sea can be seen as an act of self-preservation. Critical shipping routes worth trillions of dollars go through these waters. Whoever controls them not only controls those dollars, but the ability for the countries in the area to access the resources. If China succeeds in closing the South China Sea shipping lanes, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and other American allies in the region would have a far harder time importing the resources they need. The same principle applies with China, however. A blockade of strategic shipping lanes such as the Strait of Malacca and the Strait of Luzon would cripple the commerce China depends on that comes through these straits, and much of its commerce is vital for its basic needs. While some of the Chinese missiles can reach that far, the assets being used to enforce the blockade would be better protected by distance and have more time to react to an attack. China is testing hypersonic missiles and is regarded as being ahead of the United States in the race for these weapons that would help its offensive reach. However, they are not ready for prime time and have not been widely deployed in the Chinese military yet. China would also greatly risk its naval and air assets in an attempt to disrupt the blockade. It would be the type of head-on confrontation with the United States Navy and Air Force that would put the Chinese military at a disadvantage. China may be the world's largest manufacturing nation, but it is still unable to feed or fuel itself, while the United States can. This would be the ultimate disadvantage in a wartime scenario, reminiscent of Germany's geographical disadvantages in World War I, when the Allied blockade deprived Germany of resources and slowly strangled it into starvation and submission. In a full-scale war, the United States would attempt a similar strategy. While China's missiles would ensure that the United States could not pull off a blockade in the same way the Royal Navy did in World War I, China would still be hard-pressed to break through it. So while the United States would be in danger in a confrontation in an area like the South China Sea or the Taiwan Strait, it would not necessarily need to go there until China is steadily worn down by the blockade and attrition. The United States still has a military advantage over China, but China is trying its best to close that gap. With its population starting to decline and economic growth slowing down, the dangers of a war breaking out in the Indo-Pacific may be increasing since the Chinese communist leadership may begin to feel like its window of opportunity to remake the order in the region is closing. Regardless of how it would be fought, a war between the United States and China, even if contained, would be bloody and come at a huge price tag. Deterrence and diplomacy are more vital than ever. But what do you think? Who would have the advantage? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.